it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. How are you guys? I feel like, well, it's been, I guess, since DM1, since we've had another launch. Uh, it's been a while since I've had a live stream here in my office. We are about 30 minutes on the dot away from uh, tonight's launch. And as always, I want to help train you guys whenever you have questions about upcoming launches. I hope you know where to go by now. Uh, in case you don't, here we go. I'm going to teach you. Uh, this is... A website called everydayastronaut.com and you can click on a button that says pre-launch previews and that way you can get a rundown on exactly what's going to happen uh, on upcoming launches and of course I owe a big shout out to, to John who helps run these and get these all lined up uh, he's just been a huge help um, I couldn't do this without him so um, so this is uh, the pre-launch preview for WGS 10 and of course we're just gonna go through this real quick uh, this is going to be taking off here in, well, like the timer says, 29 minutes on March 15th. And this is the WGS-10. This is the 10th uh, wideband global SATCOM satellite. Um, it's being launched by United Launch Alliance. That's the, the, that's the of course, joint venture between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Um, they're the ones who make the Delta Series rockets and the Atlas rocket. And, of course, they're going to be producing the Vulcan rocket upcoming, uh, I think, hopefully, you know, coming out in about a year or two. Uh, the customer for this is the United States Department of Defense, which is uh, always a, those, a pretty important customer. Uh, the rocket, this is the penultimate. So this is the second to last time we'll ever see like a single stick Delta IV uh, rocket fly. So this is a Delta IV medium. It's a 5-4 variant. So that means it's a 5-meter fairing, and then it has four Gem 60 SRBs. And yeah, that's a... This is a rare beast these days. We don't see too many of these launch. It, it typically... Things like this uh, tend to end up on an Atlas V, or if they need something even beefier, they go to the Delta IV Heavy. It, I Honestly, I have a hard time figuring out when exactly is a Delta IV uh, useful over a Delta, you know, over an Atlas V loaded up and stuff. I'm sure there's crossover points, though, where it just makes sense at that price per kilogram ratio, depending on how heavy the payload is, it makes most sense to choose which vehicle. And there's probably just some small crossovers there, a little bit of you know, converging data where those two points meet, and it makes most sense to use a Delta IV. Um, so this is taking out of, and one of the things I should remind you guys uh, about the Delta IV is it's it's a hydrogen-powered first stage, which is very unusual, because hydrogen makes, uh, it's extremely efficient, you know, it has a, has a potential for a very high specific impulse, well over 400 seconds, uh, as opposed to kerosene kind of maxes out around 340 or RP1, sorry. Um, Max is at around 340 ish, 350 ish, and um, an RP or an, and hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, can actually get up to like 450. So it's a significant bit more uh, energy efficient in that sense. It's not um, as dense. I'm hearing people say that my sound is low. Um, hmm, I'm sorry, guys. Hopefully it's hopefully it's okay. Let me know if it is. Um, but yeah, so, so hydrogen is, uh, is, is very efficient, but it, it typically has lower thrust and it's not as dense. So you'll notice the rocket, the tanks are super stretched. Like the hydrogen tank is huge compared to an RP-1 tank. Like I think it's like five times bigger than the equivalent RP-1. So yeah, uh, it's nuts. <laughs> so that's, um, that's one of those things just to kind of keep in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Um, but this is heading out. This is, this is taking off from space launch complex 37, uh, slick 37B, uh, at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. So, of course, SLC, uh, Space Launch Complex, as opposed to Launch Complex, LC. Space Launch Complex denotes that it's at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Launch Complex would be Kennedy Space Center. Despite them being literally right next to each other, that is a fun, you know, thing to keep in mind. Um, this is pretty, pretty heavy. This is about 6,000 kilograms, so 13,000 pounds. That's pretty much peaking out basically this this 5-4 variant um it's 90 percent of the maximum payload variant so that's crazy this is going out to a geostationary transfer or at least it's the, the peak for going out to geostationary um so this is going out to geostationary transfer orbit um the, of course uh ula currently has no recoverability in any of their vehicles so this is not a first stage recovered of course it will uh the expended first stage will crash into the ocean downrange no fair recoverability but this is the 39th flight of the Delta IV rocket. This is the second to last Delta IV medium. Second mission for United Launch Alliance this year. 133rd mission for United Launch Alliance since forming in December of 2006. So it's it's getting up there. And of course, we have the graphic by the wonderful Jeff Barrett. Um, I love looking at these. It just kind of helps um, poop, make it ha have it all make sense. Um, I want to know, Jeff, I got to figure out where you're getting your, 
your renders from because I think that's a really good that's like the best render of a Delta four I've ever seen. Um, I have a hard time finding some of those sometimes that all look like uniform uh, besides Reese making them for me and then they look fantastic. But yeah, so that's kind of what's going on here today. Um, I hope everyone's just doing fantastic. I've had quite the uh, ever since DM one guys, I have just been like I've been working on I've been doing some like scripting and things like that and kind of doing some other back end things. But man, there has been so much stuff news wise that I'm even having a hard time. Like I go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on what to even talk about because we have stuff to talk about, like SLS future, the future of SLS. Like what? That's all of a sudden super in question right now. For those of you that don't know, that's the space launch system. And that's something that that came from the Constellation era. So way back in like 2006 or 8 or whenever it was, Constellation was made up of the Ares 1 and the Ares 5. Ares 1 got scrapped and replaced by the Commercial Crew Program, which we just saw DM1 uh, as the first real proof of the Commercial Crew Project. Um, but then we have things like uh, the SLS, which, which was basically like an Orion, which kind of came from the Constellation Program. Um, and all of a sudden we're seeing that that the administration is wanting to push forward on the 2020 um, test flight around the moon um, of the Orion capsule known as EM-1, Exploration Mission 1. It's uncrewed. There would be no one on it. And this was, it's only physically capable of being launched on an SLS right now on a single launch. That's the key. You know, it takes an SLS sized vehicle. This SLS is crazy powerful. Like it's, it's, it's literally a space shuttle without the orbiter another uh, another RS-25 main engine and bigger SRBs and an upper stage. A del for now, the, the variant would be with a Delta. The same, actually, literally the same upper stage as what's going to be on tonight's uh, Delta IV launch. That's what SLS is today as it exists, as it's being developed currently. That is so, it's getting so far scrubbed, so far pushed back that they're looking at flying. Um, they still want to do that 2020 mission of EM-1 with the Orion, do a real shakedown of it. And they're looking at doing it on commercial providers, taking two launches, um, docking a boost stage or some kind of kick stage to get it out there uh, around the moon. It's actually really exciting, in my opinion. Um, it's definitely, in my opinion, <laughs> this is my opinion. This is definitely the kind of the beginning, like one of the first nails in the coffin for SLS. Um, they no longer have plans for any other block variants of SLS, which is huge because it was supposed to be like, a shakedown version and then like beef it up, beef it up, beef it up, beef it up even more. Basically all those have been, all those have been retracted. And now if they're looking at replacing it with two simple commercial launches, um, particularly uh, the only two vehicles even capable of this are Delta four heavy and Falcon heavy. And if they replace it with that, that kind of tells Congress kind of tells the industry kind of sets the tone that, you know what? One SLS, which costs well over a billion dollars per launch can probably be replaced with two commercial launchers that would most likely even, you know, depending on, on the, what it requires would for sure be at least half that price. Um, there's also going to be, there of course be development costs and things like how do you dock and rendezvous with the Orion capsule to another upper stage? You know, it requires autonomous docking and, and new docking ports and docking adapters and all these different things to make that physically happen. It re that's going to require development. That's going to require work. But SLS is basically bookmarked a billion dollars a year in its development anyway. So the sooner we can cut that, <laughs> the sooner we can uh, look into like things like autonomous rendezvous and docking of an upper stage in an Orion capsule. Or even more important, imagine if we wanted to send like, you know, Europa Clipper sized missions, really heavy payloads to say Jupiter or Saturn um, that would have required a massive rocket like SLS. What if we develop a new system that's a new standard that says, hey, send up the primary payload, send up the probe on, you know, a, a Falcon Heavy. And then we have this thing that's an inter, interplanetary kick stage that will help us get these payloads. And it's a system that's a, a docking adapter, a, a new protocol that allows for attaching to payloads. It's just kind of a new, a new subsystem or something that's kind of standardized. It says, here, you put it up in Leo, we'll launch up this, you know, this other kick stage with these, with this predetermined set of like docking adapter things. This is very Kerbal Space Program because it's not nearly this simple. Developing something like this would be very difficult, but very doable. And then we could have a new way of getting, you know, things out on, you know, massive probes on direct missions out to Jupiter and Saturn without, you know, gravity insists and all this stuff. It's really cool. Hey, guess what? I've got some news here for you guys. And I will get to all your guys' uh, comments here at, at some point. Um, but we have something to watch right now, and this is 
I'm excited to see this because I I have seen the Delta Four um, medium and a Delta Four heavy, and I do really enjoy this vehicle. At Space Launch Complex 37, a Delta IV rocket is fueled and ready to launch the WGS-10 mission for the United States Air Force. Good evening and welcome to Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. I'm Andrea Lenhoff. I'm a systems engineer on the Vulcan Centaur Development Program. The launch team is not currently working any issues and we're proceeding towards liftoff at 7.11 p.m. Eastern Time. Cool. A few minutes from now, the count will enter a planned 10-minute hold. There are two planned holds in our nine and a half hour launch count. The planned holds give our time gives our team additional time to resolve any issues prior to entering the terminal count. Clay Flynn, the 45th Space Wing Weather Officer, recently briefed the launch team on current weather conditions here at Cape Canaveral. The probability of violating launch constraints is 0%. The ground winds are 16 knots out of the southeast, and the temperature is 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So the weather is within the launch commit criteria and looks favorable for the plan T0 of 7.11 p.m. Eastern Time. I should explain that their T minus time is until their planned hold. And our time until launch is actually probably more accurate for the actual time it will launch. So just keep that in mind. Launch pad here at Cape Canaveral. Let's take a look at what else we can expect to see today. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, our 68A engine ignition, 1. And we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket. The Delta IV RS-68A engine and four solid rocket motors, or SRMs, ignite to lift the rocket away from the pad. Shortly after liftoff, Delta IV begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path while minimizing the pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. The Delta IV reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 34 seconds. The SRMs burn out 1 minute 33 seconds into flight. Seven seconds later, the first two SRMs are jettisoned, followed by the remaining two SRMs. During ascent, WGS-10 is protected inside a five meter diameter payload fairing. At approximately three minutes, 19 seconds, the payload fairing is jettisoned. Approaching main engine cutoff, Delta IV is burning propellant at a rate of 991 pounds per second, located 109 miles in altitude and 229 miles downrange. At three minutes, 56 seconds, propellant levels deplete and the booster engine shuts down. Six seconds later, the Delta IV separation system activates to release the first stage. The vehicle now weighs a little more than 9% of what it did at liftoff. At four minutes, 15 seconds, the second stage main engine. So because we're gonna see all this, I wanna point out some fun things here. Um, number one is this upper stage uses the RL-10B, or is RL-10-2, uh, B-2, the one that has the extending nozzle. So the nozzle is actually nice and compact uh, in the inner stage, allowing for a shorter inner stage, and then the nozzle extends, and you'll actually see that hopefully in the webcast. The other fun thing is notice the orange part. That's the only part of the upper stage that is actually structural. Um, the rest of, and that's part of the, um, the hydrogen tank, the oxygen tank and the engine and stuff um, don't carry any of the thrust load uh, while the first stage is attached. That actually all goes through the inner stage. I just think it's kind of unique that that stuff's basically hanging down into the inner stage. Um, there's a few other things that I want to point out, but I want to make sure we're not missing anything else here. Um, oh, it's a, another fun thing is that they ditch, um, they ditch their fairing before first stage cuts off. And that's different from, you know, for the, most missions, oh. our customers provide artwork, which is added to the payload fairing. For today's mission, there are 10 stars organized around the perimeter to reflect the 10 WGS missions. The hang 10 and shock a hand symbol pay homage to <laughs> Boeing's Southern California Satellite Production Center and the local pastime of hanging 10 toes off the front of a surfboard. At the bottom we read, For the Warfighter, to remind us of the impact and purpose of the WGS constellations. Finally, the platypus with the ray brings us full circle as it reemerges from the very first WGS logo. I have never, I didn't see that logo before. That is amazing. I never realized either that hang 10 means hang 10 toes off the end of a surfboard. I, 
guess that makes a lot of sense. What if a shark eats one of your toes, then do you hang nine? I mean, it doesn't sound very inclusive to me. Um, but I did not know that. It looks like a beautiful, oh man, that looks like a, this is going to be like just perfect timing. Sunset, we're probably going to have a gorgeous sky. Oh, I'm excited to see what that actually looks like here today. Um, and of course, you can see some of the liquid oxygen venting there. Um, that's normal, uh, especially this is the Delta Mission Control. We are about to enter a planned 10 minute hold. <laughs> so, yeah, so now you'll see in T minus four minutes, or they'll, they'll hold here at T minus four minutes, and we'll go into a 10 minute hold. So, that's why you see my launch timer up here, the time until launch. That's the actual time we hope to see this thing take off. So now you'll see the clock. Their clock will four stop. Minutes in holding. This is a 10 minute built in hold. And this is ALC, please adjust the clock for a new T0 of 23 colon 11 colon 000. Roger. LC switch to the not ready position. And these holds are planned. This is intentional. This is when they do the review. Built in Decatur, Alabama, the Delta IV Medium Plus 5.4 includes a common booster core powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-68A engine and four orbital ATK solid rocket motors. An Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10 B2 engine powers a Delta Cryogenic second stage. WGS-10 is protected during ascent by a 5-meter diameter payload fairing. Final launch preparations began on February 18th when WGS-10 was encapsulated inside the payload fairing. On February 26th, the encapsulated payload fairing was transported to the Mobile Service Tower, or MST, at Space Launch Complex 37 and made it to the Delta IV rocket. Approximately nine and a half hours ago, final preparations began at Space Launch Complex 37. Using 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 PSI, the 10 million pound MST was raised eight inches and rolled back, revealing the Delta IV launch vehicle. It's crazy, the whole building moves. Using a carriage transporter system, traveling at about a quarter mile per hour, it takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST to its final position, 345 feet north of the Delta IV rocket. The Delta IV rocket stands 217 feet tall, or about 21 stories, and weighs more than 900,000 pounds fully fueled. The RS-68A main engine and four solid rocket motors combined to produce approximately 1.7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. About four minutes later, at stage separation, it weighs just 10% of what it did at liftoff. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. Today's launch will deliver the 10th satellite for the Wideband Global SATCOM system. Built by Boeing, WGS is an important element of a new high-capacity satellite communication system, providing enhanced communications capabilities to U.S. and allied warfighters for the next decade and beyond. Each WGS satellite provides more wideband communications capacity than the entire defense satellite communication system, the constellation WGS is augmenting. Cool. Um, Later in the broadcast, <laughs> we'll learn more about the WGS mission when I'm joined by Tim Maurer, Boeing software engineer, and Sam Wiley, U.S. Air Force Chief of Business Operations. Also, make sure to stay tuned after launch because Sam, Wiley, and I will be hosting a game of trivia on Twitter featuring questions about past WGS missions. A few minutes after liftoff, questions will be posted on ULA's Twitter account, and the first person to comment on the question with the correct answer will receive a very special prize. We're doing this. We're definitely doing Answers that. Answers and winners will be announced shortly before spacecraft separation. In addition to watching our webcast, you can always follow live mission progress at ulalaunch.com. Sweet. That that actually sounds like a lot of fun. The only thing is I don't know that much about the WGS constellation. I know a decent amount about their rockets, but the constellation itself 
not very much at all. <laughs> so mm, I'll need you guys' help. That's funny. Uh, I'll definitely get to your guys' comments when it's the appropriate time. I don't like just trying to shove them all in there like I have done in the past. Um, I, I In our Discord channel, someone, I, I forget who now, uh, AGR asked, why, why don't they just add 10 minutes to the countdown or if it's planned? This is just the way ULA does things. They they want to do a last second. They're kind of doing, they'll do their polling here, and then they'll put it into a the totally automated uh, four-minute countdown sequence. And that's just different. Uh, it's kind of the way they've always done things. Uh, it makes sense to them. It is it's so weird okay, when you one, watch Casey. their launches. Oh, you okay, we're still uh, working, uh, troubleshooting on the CBC bottle press and the uh, oh my, high flow uh, demand. Uh, we do not have a workable plan yet, and uh, we need to continue our troubleshooting. Uh, I do not have an estimate for you at this point. So Roger that. that. Get and a for little the team, I'll continue down just prior to the L7 pole, and we'll stand by at that point. LD, LC, net one. LD, L1. And with that expectation, I'll, as stated, I'll proceed down towards the L7 pole. We'll hold off there, and uh, at that point, I'll give you direction. We'll extend the hold. Concur. All communications switch to channel one. All personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch. Maintain operational silence in the LCC. RC, verify solar radiation limits acceptable for launch. Verified. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint any time after a terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel one identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. So it's not off for the day. Um, flight they, control, Elsie. Flight control. Perform launch on time verification. OSM, verify the hold fire switch is in the proceed position. Hold fire switch is in the proceed position. They're not giving up yet, guys, but they do have to work an issue with what it sounds RLM, like. RLM, verify red line monitor and vent table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. Verified. As you just heard, the team is currently working an issue. We plan on extending the built-in hold to work this issue. So it sounded like some kind of... Uh, this so evening's yeah. flight is dedicated in memory of Kurt Hushley, a colleague, friend, and patriot. During his 30-year aerospace career, Kurt held critical roles on multiple programs, including High Indo-Atmospheric Defense Interceptor, Nighthawk, Space Station, and various classified programs. He finished his career as Electrical Installations Lead for Delta IV. Kurt was a supportive coworker, sharing his wealth of design knowledge, as well as a consummate professional, always able to deliver a quality product while adapting to design changes and keeping pace with a rapid launch rate. Kurt was a caring individual, dedicated to his career, family, and friends. He exuded joy and humor wherever he went and will be remembered and missed by all he touched. I really like that they dedicate their rockets to their their employees. I think that's a really, really cool thing. What a what an awesome way to remember someone's life with the an awesome rocket launch. I mean, that is, that's, that's something we could all strive for. I mean, talk about goals. That's, can you imagine that much horsepower and firepower launching you literally into the heavens? Like that's, if I think about it too much, I'll probably cry, but that is really cool. Um, touche ULA. That is such an awesome idea. And I'm really glad you guys do that. That's really cool. Um, so we did turn that's off. Cool, yeah. We did turn off my countdown clock because that needs to be updated um, once we get a new T0. Hopefully, the, my countdown clock will be automatically updated um, when the launch uh, alarm thing changes it or whatever. It was. What's that called? It's like an API that changes automatically. NLC, this is flight control on one. Listen. Go. Launch on time. Verify. Roger. Okay, all personnel. All steps are complete prior to status check except for the uh, troubleshooting we're uh, working on with the uh, pneumatic system. Mm, All personnel will stand by and LD, LC, that one. LD on one. Yeah, at this time we need to uh, extend the hold at T minus four minutes. 
Roger, concur. So yeah, it sounds like they're working like probably a hydraulic system issue, which would likely be in their uh, TVC, their thrust vector control. Um, both the RL10B2 and the RS68 um, have thrust vector control. So it's a, you know, the hydraulics steer the nozzle on the engine. That's how it guides itself through space uh, and while it's in the atmosphere. So that's a very important thing to have working correctly. So obviously they're, if they're having some kind of, sometimes those issues guys are, are literally like, you know, there's, you're talking about cryogenic temperatures, you're talking about all these variables and sometimes those things just wiggle free. Sometimes they warm up. Sometimes it, a sensor predicts something wrong. This is wrong. Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. We remain in the planned 10 minute built in hold as preparations for launch continue. Soon, launch conductor Scott Barney will pull the launch team for the final go to pick up the countdown. 27 engineers and managers are pulled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is the final status check before launch for all Delta vehicle systems, ground systems, the spacecraft, and the U.S. Air Force Eastern Range. The vehicle system readiness pool includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Yeah, Loopy brings up a good point in our Discord channel that um, the Delta IV just really doesn't launch that often. And it seems like every time it does, it always has some kind of teething issue, some kind of like, uh, like it almost seems to always go off like on the second or third try. Um, every one that I've been to, I think, has had a one day hold, including the Delta IV heavy. I've saw, I saw a Delta IV medium uh, just like this once, actually. Uh, no, it only had two SRBs, I believe. Um, yeah, so it, it is, uh, it's just that it's not flown as often. The Atlas V flies a lot more often is um in that sense a lot more reliable like i said it's kind of i still have a hard time figuring out when they choose to fly an atlas and when a delta but there's must be a crossover point where it just makes more sense probably some of those geo missions having um all hydrogen and a bigger hydrogen five meter upper stage um it carries it's like i think 30 tons basically is the the weight of that five meter upper stage compared to uh like 20 tons for the center upper stage so the center upper stage is uh, has is, is considering it's basically the same engine. The Centaur upper stage has less Delta V compared to the um, the Delta IVs upper stage. And I noticed someone in chat did ask, um, you know, didn't we already see the last Delta IV? We saw the last Delta II. That's the teal rocket. It's a lot smaller, a lot less capable. It's just a medium um, medium launch vehicle. Uh, and that we saw the last one of uh, the last Delta II last year, I believe, at the end of. Uh, I think this is the end of 2018, um, but this is Delta IV. This is the second to last Delta IV because this is getting phased out. Uh, Vulcan re will replace these launches. Vulcan has a lot wider range, um, basically depending on how many SRBs they strap onto that thing. Um, someone else asked a really good question about why do they have different nozzles on each SRB, and that does confuse me a tiny bit because this vehicle doesn't do the staged SRB launches like um, the Delta the Delta II Heavy had uh this had nine if SRBs. you're just joining us the team is currently working an issue as we remain in the planned hold we will continue to update you as information becomes available so um yeah you can see the srbs look slightly different but some of that might be just the way which ones are mounted on which end you know and, and how it fits around the base of the vehicle i can't really tell um the nozzles on the srbs sorry the solid rocket boosters are those you know the four little uh, white cones basically at the bottom, you know, those, and those are uh, solid rocket boosters. When you ignite them, you can't turn them off. They're very high uh, thrust to weight ratio. Typically they're not very efficient, but they help. And in if like this engine, the RS 68 is very low thrust compared to um, a typical um, RP one engine, like what's used on the Falcon nine and the Atlas rocket. So um, it's, it's common to see if you have a hydrogen powered first stage, you'll almost almost always see SRBs attached to it. Not always like the Delta four heavy, uh, but you know, the space shuttle, it was primarily hydrogen, uh, first stage, but also, well, actually thrust wise, it was entirely those SRBs basically, but SRBs are very commonly used with hydrogen, uh, because of its low thrust to weight ratio. And those SRBs are just there to give it enough kick to get off the ground. Now, what I was saying though, before Delta two heavy had 
nine SRBs are on the base and they'd light six at, on the ground that were optimized for sea level. And then they'd ditch those and light three more SRBs only like a minute and a half or two minutes into flight or something. And those were more vacuum optimized. So they're a little bit more efficient. I thought that was kind of cool. This vehicle doesn't do that. They, they drop all four SRBs relatively quickly. So one might be, one might burn for like two or four seconds longer or something. They don't all separate at the same time, but maybe that's also something to do with the difference in nozzles. But yeah, um, the, the window ends, by the way, um, at 9.05 Eastern, which is about two hours from now. So we might be sitting here for a little bit, folks. Uh, I have no idea. We just got to wait in and see if we get any updates, um, see if any of the issues with the what sounds like hydraulics, which most likely means t thrust vector control, the thing that steers the rocket. Not a bad thing to have. Probably a good thing you, you want working. Uh, we will have to wait and see what they say, if they can work the issue while it's on the pad. Um, again, it might be something where they, they do have to reset and go for tomorrow. I don't know. Unfortunately, I'm actually probably going to be out of town for about the, the next week or so. So if it does, if it doesn't go off today, I don't think I'll be able to, uh, recover from that and be able to, you know, live stream it with you guys, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I do apologize. So, so taking as much of me as you can right now, I'm just taking, I, I'm taking a mini sabbatical. I probably, you probably see a lot of YouTubers taking little breaks. Uh, it's because the burnout threat is very real. DM1 wore me about to the ground. Uh, just so much, like just so much everything. Uh, and it just kind of took a, took a little toll and I haven't quite recovered from that. So I'm just taking a little, I want to make sure I take a big deep breath, uh, reset, refocus, um, make sure that, that I'm mentally, uh, still totally where I want to be with work and everything and make sure I don't burn out. Cause I don't think most YouTubers don't recover if they burn out and it's a, it's a lot of work. Uh, the YouTube thing, I know that might seem pretty great and it can be really great and can be really rewarding and really fun. But let me tell you, it's, uh, when you're a self-motivated person and you end up working 80 hours a week, like every week after week, after week, after week. Um, and waking up in the middle of the night to do random Not only do things. we have the broadcast you're currently listening to, we also just started a blog, which can be viewed at our website, ulalaunch.com. Also, to stay up to date with the most recent launch information, please visit our social media, which is at ULA Launch, at Twitter, and on Instagram. Yeah, so um, again, we're kind of going to be waiting for them to see what exactly happens. But why don't we go through some of your guys' questions? We had a lot of uh, good questions. Clay Bennett is out at Port Canaveral to see the launch. Clay, I hope you get to see that. And thank you so much for your tip. I really, it looks like it's a nice night. It'd be really cool. The rocket should have gone off about two minutes ago. Uh, if it was on time, that looks like it would have been beautiful. So I do apologize for you having to wait. But, you know, there's. There's worse places you can be than hanging out on a beach waiting for a rocket to launch. I mean, so I'm not going to I'm not going to cry <laughs> too much for you. That does sound really nice. Uh, uh, Dylan is chilling. Hey, Tim, thanks for being a huge inspiration to all. Thank you, Dylan is. Jeez, I that actually does really mean a lot. And thank you, Paul. Ian, you're welcome. Uh, Thales, how are you doing? Delta Corn Medium. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know the Delta, the Falcorn heavy shirts that we made. Uh, probably could have easily been Delta corn heavy, of course, but you know, it does look just like, it's not my fault that the, the Delta four looks like a ear of corn. It's kind of tall ear of corn. The side boosters of Delta heavy when it's just the common core booster with a nose cap. That looks like an ear of corn. All right. So, uh, Paul, can you I'll get this red line monitor? Ooh, this is Go red line monitor. Roger. We picked up an OTC on the second stage locks airborne tank. PU delta pressure. It's just above the upper limit of 4.76. Roger. ACLC net one. ACL one. Yes, uh, RLM is reporting a uh, alarm. Second stage locks airborne tank uh, PU delta P press. Please convene on the team provide recommendation. Welcome. Okay, so it's just slightly above pressure, but hmm, I, I don't know what they do in this case. They're going to be looking through the anomaly team to make sure uh, they have a recommendation. They might, you know, they might be something like open. They might drain 
that the hydraulic system quick, you know, or they might be pressurizing something differently. Who knows how exactly they work? We might see some venting. We might see they might vent helium. You know, it's it's hard. I don't know what they're doing at this point. This is one of those things that I hope to hear more on on the radio. So as soon as they come on, I'll definitely want to listen and see if I can pick up on, on any of those things. So um, hopefully <laughs> hopefully they, they're able to uh, fix it tonight because, yeah, like I said, I, re- I do really want to see this thing go off tonight. Um, let's keep going here. Uh, Paul. Hey, Paul again. Uh, Tim, can you give a shout out to your daughters, Lily and Susanna? Of course. Hi, Lily and Susanna. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I hope that you guys are learning and enjoying watching rockets as much as I am. I, there's nothing more exciting than seeing something leave earth and go to space. To me, that's honestly about as cool as it gets. So thank you for tuning in. And, uh, I hope if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, so thanks, Paul, and to your family. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Folkert, greetings from uh, Gron- Groningen. I don't even know where that is. Gron- Groningen? Thank you uh, from there. Uh, that's great. Milo TV, thank you. Convergent, how you doing? Hey, Tim, greetings from Edinburgh, Scotland. I was wondering if, you're ever, if I've ever visited the UK, and if so, what were your thoughts? Uh, oh, this is where I'm going to get in trouble because of how confusing my geography is. Uh, now you guys, someone's going to yell at me right away. I can't wait for this. There's Great Britain, the UK, which I believe the UK includes Ireland. Does it? Or is that part of Great Britain? And then there's like England, which is one of the countries in there. If the UK includes Ireland, I have been to the UK. Otherwise, uh, no, I have not visited anywhere else uh, in there. <laughs> uh, let's see, North Ireland, but I have not been to Northern Ireland. Um, man, I am sorry. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> uh, so I have been to Ireland, but not... I know Ireland's a country. Guys, I know it's a country. I just don't know whether it's part of... How does that all work? What's What is Ireland a part of? That is including Wales, England, like Northern Ireland. What's UK, England, Wales. Oh, you guys are going too quick. You guys are going too quick. I can't read. (laughs) Wait, 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 wait. I did. Did I not call Ireland a country? Jeez. I said I was in the country of Ireland. What are you guys talking about? (laughs) Yes, I know it's a separate country. Okay, Ireland doesn't have to do with the UK. I am now learning that. But then what does Ireland have to do with? Because it's, like I said, there's like four. Is that part of Great Britain? I'm aware that it's... (laughs) I know that Ireland's in Europe. Oh, I am in... Okay, I know it has nothing... I know it's a country! (laughs) England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Okay, that's what I needed to know. The UK this is, Delta mission control is those four. At T minus four minutes in holding. So the what? team is currently working the issue reported early, earlier through a test. While we wait, let's look at some launch footage from the previous nine WGS launches all atop United Launch Alliance, Atlas V, and Delta IV rockets. Well... I'm learning something here, guys. Well, first off, it's probably not a very good sign that they're just going to show us a bunch of launch footage. Um, That probably means that (laughs) we're in some fairly significant hold here. Okay, so I'm I'm learning um, that Ireland is fully Ireland. For some reason, I thought there was still a name that embodies all of those islands as, like, one thing. Maybe it wasn't, like, you know... The United Kingdom, I apologize there. But I always thought there was like one name that unifies all of that. Because like I don't I know, you know. Okay. I, I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> uh on this episode of Tim Doesn't Know. <laughs> uh could I give you advice on becoming an astronaut? Know your geography. That's my advice on becoming an astronaut. So, okay, back to, back to, uh, so, greetings from Scotland. I've never been to the UK. Now I know how to answer that question. Nope, I've never been to the UK, but I've been very close to it and to its brother. 
known as Ireland, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I've uh, I've flown. Have I flown in and out of? I think I've been into he. I've flown in and out of Heathrow before, but that's that doesn't count. That was just a, a stopover. But I that's definitely on my to do list for sure. For sure, I, there's so much that I want to see uh, in that area. Especially, I'm a huge fan of Top Gear, um, at least like old Top Gear. So I feel like I pretty much have watched and <laughs> know everything but the geography of <laughs> of the UK. Man. Well, now I'm learning. So people want to know that just joined um, that uh, that we're still waiting. There is an issue with hydraulics that we're waiting. They're in a hold. This is their planned hold. But this is also this planned hold is when they review um, any issues. And they do have an issue today. They do have um, a hydraulic issue that's probably most likely uh, in regards to the thrust vector control. I haven't heard for sure what it's in regards to, but that's pretty much one of the only things. Unless I think they use pyrotechnics for their inner staging and their staging decoupler. So I don't think they use hydraulic pushers for that. So they did say it was in the upper stage. So most likely they have a hydraulic issue. They could have, I, I don't want to stop totally. Uh, I don't want to totally go down uh, a rabbit hole without hearing more information here. But those are just what, what I would think of as likely. Um, so uh, intelligent intuition, you rock at space talk for peeps. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Intelligent intuition. That really means a lot. Um, I like space. And I like talking to people, so hopefully that works out. Martin, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know why I really like that. Come, Quat Lord, how are you? I, I've seen your name before. What up, my dude? Do you think you'd do a video on SRBs? I'm curious about their development and the such. Absolutely. So one of the videos that I've been scripting for about a week and a half now, because I've really wanted to do it right, and I really, really want like the animations to work out really well, because... It's one of those topics that I, I personally just see diagrams of how rocket engines work all the time, especially the different cycles, you know, like open cycle gas generator and closed cycle and, you know, even just a uh, pressure based and, and dual tank, you know, dual prop pressure fed system. I've seen diagrams of that stuff, but to really understand how it works, I haven't seen very good animation. So that's one of the things I'm doing for this upcoming video. And it's taken me down some serious, serious rabbit holes. Uh, one of those things that I want to make sure I have as good of a resource as I can to give you guys to help you. And th this is this particular video will be to put in place the Raptor engine because everyone's hearing about the Raptor engine. Everyone's hearing it's amazing and a miracle. So I'm hoping to explain why it's considered such uh, potentially the king of rocket engines uh, using the full flow close cycle. Uh, so in order to do that, I'm going to explain the different cycles of engines. I'm going to explain why methane and all that stuff. So it's going to be a long one of my longer videos which I, I have had good feedback on. So my whole point is that if you're one of those people out there that hears a lot about, say, the Raptor engine, and you don't know why it's special, hopefully by watching the video, you have all the context. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. And everything you need. Two tests have been run to resolve the issue reported earlier, and both have been successful. Ooh. We are still awaiting an update on a new T0. Okay. Hey, progress. I like that. That'd be great. Let's get this thing off the ground today. That'd be awesome. But again, Go Fever is real. So ULA has always been very, they they hold out of full abundance of caution. I'm not saying that SpaceX doesn't either or other companies, but ULA has always shown patience and um, making sure that, that the payload is the number one priority. And so when they see things like this, uh, it's get ready because they're, they're not afraid to hold. And either is Peter Beck. Peter Beck has definitely said like, I don't care. I'll hold all day long. And he's, you know, I've always had the mentality that holds and scrubs are cheaper than booms. Uh, he definitely seemed to have, uh, you know, uh, carried that same sentiment. Martin, <laughs> back at it again. Uh, where am I? I love it. Uh, oh, by the way, and, and Kumquat Lord. Uh, well, I, I think you're in Norway based on the NOK. Is that Norwegian kroner? Um, but Kumquat Lord, just to let you know, I'm thinking about making that video about the Raptor doing all these animations about the different cycles, but not do all of the cycles, just do kind of the order of like from simplest leading up to why the full flow closed cycle engine is so impressive and so difficult and, and never flown before. Take that out also and put it into another video that just is like, here are all rocket engines. Here's how they all work. And, in, and do a, a thing about, you know, SRBs as well in that. So here's like, 
the basics of rocket engines or how this, you know, run down on the cycles of engines so I can take the same amount of work that I did, all the animations and all that LPN stuff. LPN-1 is AC. Let's see what they say. I see. Okay, radio out brief, both of the anomalies we've been working. Roger, LD net one. LD net one. MD net one. MDM one. Proceed, AC. Okay, first one was the uh, second stage LOX Delta P that uh, had the RLM trip. Uh, we have reviewed that. Uh, it was based on the situation at the time. No impact to uh, proceeding with count. Our recommendation is proceed. LC concurs, LD. LD concurs. MD. MD concurs. Second was the uh, ongoing um, uh, attempts to establish the booster bottle press uh, scenario. Uh, we have established and, and shown repeatability with our latest plan. The p and &E operator uh, uh, has uh, shown that the recovery works fine with the set points we've established. We're recommending uh, disabling uh, two lines in RLM. That would be line item 1 and 9. And we've established with the p and &E operator also the limits to be monitored to and uh, uh, at what point uh, it would uh, need to call hold if it does not make it. We do have confidence in this plan and recommend proceeding. Sweet. Good. So they are going forward. We'll LC do... concurs. LD. LD concurs. T0 time. MD. Now. MD concurs. LD is launch director. PNE, LC net one. MD is mission director. p and is on one. Roger. Um... First, IQ verify CBC is at flight pre uh, bottles are at flight pressure. CBC bottles are at flight pressure. Roger. And you are uh, ready to uh, proceed with the anomaly team recommendation. Yes, I've been uh, listening into the anomaly team recommendation and ready to proceed with that. Roger. RLM, Elsie. Go ahead. Please disable line items one and nine for Roger. anomaly team direct. Roger. Inward. Sweet. This is good. They are making progress. They are pushing forward to launch tonight. They basically did the old, maybe hey, turn it on and turn it off again, it sounds like, uh, to reset the system. And everything seems to be back in check. Um, this is good. And again, uh, for those of you that are just tuning in, we do, we're do we used to seeing the T-4 minute hold. Line items 1 and 9 have been disabled and verified in the Red Line Monitor program. Roger. Cool. So hopefully we get a new T0 time here in a second. Um, and then hope we'll have a better sense of how long we have to wait until they that T-4, the actual terminal count, uh, turns on. So my guess would be probably in the next, we'll know probably in the next five minutes a new T0, and then we'll hopefully see um, within a half hour, hopefully, um, a launch if everything's looking good. So hang tight. Let's... Uh, Keep listening in here, and hopefully we'll get a, we'll get a new time established. We'll we'll know exactly what's going on, um, but this is looking good. I'm glad that they were able to resolve the issue. Um, that's always a good thing. That is one of the nice things about not using super chilled propellants is that you, the vehicle can sit safe for hours. Um, that's always a good thing. And you'll notice that last shot that was back there a second ago. There's a flame, and actually you can see the flame over here. That is the hydrogen. Uh, I forget what it's called, like a hydrogen diverter. Um, hydrogen tap off, I think it's called. Um, and it basically, there you go. There's another good shot of the hydrogen tap off. I think that's what it's called. Someone will correct me. Um, on the left side of the this screen. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. The launch team has worked two is issues and is ready to proceed with the launch count. We are still waiting on the official announcement of a new T zero. Um. So yeah, uh, that shot, see right here, I don't know if you can see, yeah, my mouse right there. Um, it looks like the vehicle's on fire. That's actually that tap off that's um, uh, several hundred meters away, actually. It's a, it's a good amount away from the rocket. It's just behind it. Kind of makes it look like the rocket's a little bit on fire. You will see this rocket when it ignites its main RS-68A engine. You will see it actually light itself on fire. So that's just a little taste of things to come because when it lights up that RS-68 engine, um, it first flows the hydrogen through the, the, the fuel pumps. And then uh, some of that hydrogen actually flows up and they start igniting it on purpose using basically giant sparklers to make sure that it doesn't all ignite at once. So it kind of flames it and it, it, all the stuff that comes out ends up catching fire. You'll notice it'll literally burn the side of the rocket before liftoff. 
It looks crazy. The Delta four looks even more heavy. It looks even more nuts because it will do that on all three cores. All three cores light up and fire. They get engulfed in flames before they take off. It looks nuts. Uh, it's expected. It's normal. Um, it's just the way the system works. And that's also actually one of the, the concerns for human safety. That's uh, one of the things that factors into the reason why the Delta four is not human certified um, is because of the old barbecue it does at liftoff, which yeah, it's kind of a shame because this actually would be a, it's a fairly, you know, very reliable vehicle. And uh, it seems like, you know, it's the right diameter for something like Orion. Uh, we saw it launch on a Orion launch on a Delta four heavy in 2014 for EFT one uh, in December. And uh, it looked perfect. Orion looked fantastic on top of a Delta four heavy. So it's kind of a bit of a shame that it's not crew rated. Um, of course, the Orion capsule that launched for EFT T1 was uncrewed. No one was on it. But it would have been really cool. Delta one is AC. Okay, here we go. Oh, I see. Okay, we need to uh, readdress the Delta P uh, second stage lock um, recommendation. Uh, some additional information has been reviewed, and uh, I need to go to six for this. Roger. Uh, proceed to net six. Provide a recommendation. We'll go. So it looks like maybe that issue is still cropping up. They need a little more time to review. But again. Time to review is not a bad thing when you're about to, you know, light a few million kilograms or whatever of hydrogen. You want to make sure everything's good to go. Sorry, probably not a few million, but a lot of a lot of propellant, a lot of a lot of explosive things. You want to make sure everything's good to go before you hit the go button because you don't you don't get a chance to, to turn it off once it leaves the pad. Um, you're committed at that point and you better be darn sure you're ready to go once you once it leaves the pad once those srbs light you're going somewhere and you better hope it's where you're intended to go so yeah maybe not a maybe not a bad idea yeah w wiggle the cord <laughs> um a process flare there we go um potential flammable gases burn off any excess to keep it from reaching explosion points says con wolf thank you a process flare I've, yeah um, I've also heard it, I think, called, yeah, flare sounds right. So you can see that process flare over there, making sure that um, any hydrogen venting is uh, not causing any kind of dangerous clouds of, of explosive hydrogen. We've all seen the Hindenburg footage probably, and you know what it looks like when a giant cloud of hydrogen blows up. Um, yeah. So hopefully we get a new update here soon. I'll keep going through you guys' uh, questions here. Joe, uh, never going to give you. I'm never going to let you down. I just got Rickrolled. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm going to take that as not a Rickroll, and I'm going to take that as purely... Thank you, Joe. Glad to know that someone won't give me up, and you won't let me down. TF Racing, I saw this this comment. This made me smile when it came in. Uh, they're racing at Sebring at the moment. Oh, if it had gone off for sure, they would have seen it. But um, TF Racing says they're racing at Sebring at the moment, and will likely be able to see the launch from the track if it goes off before line the line race matter. is over. Go red line matter. Here we go. Roger, we did trip the same um, OTC on the Delta P that we had discussed earlier, and the Anomaly team is discussing it on 6. Copy that. Same issue. It's cropping up. <laughs> Dang it. Well, it's not over yet. It's not over until it's over. Um, they still have a good hour and a half at this point to work the issue while they're still within their window. Um, so who knows? Unplug it and plug it back in again. That does a surprising amount sometimes. Again, when you're dealing with cryogenics, sometimes turning off flow or um, you know turning off the cold aspect of it can unfreeze valves. Crazy things happen when uh, when vehicles sit out like this, and, and as the ambient temperature outside changes compared to the crazy cryogenic temperatures inside the vehicle as it's you know coming to life. It's, it's pretty common to see little things uh, like all of a sudden stop working or all of a sudden start working while they're on the pad. It's not that uncommon. So we just get to play the, the patience game and hope that it still happens to go off this evening um, before the time ends. So again, we have one and a half hours uh, on the dot basically left in this launch window for them to address the issue, get this baby flying. So fingers crossed. Um, Jason, uh, sounds like I missed Jason's question. I didn't see anything from Jason. Hang on, I'm not, I, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't think I'm caught up yet. Um, Jason, let me know in our Discord if I missed your question. 
All right. Uh, so yeah, maybe we'll see it from the track again. An obvious, obvious troller. That's a great name. Thank you, Martin. Norway first, Sweden second. Oh, we have a little, a little race here between European countries, European brothers and and neighbors. Um, I do love both Norway and Sweden. Uh, Micah, how are you? And enjoy some nice dinner during your absence. Well, th yeah. I thank you very, very much for that. I. That that's actually very sweet of you. Thank you. I will, I'll find some good food, um, on the road somewhere. Thank you, Jason Lee. Thank you so much, Jeffrey Tripp. How come ULA seem to have the most issues? Um, I honestly. Delta L one is AC. Great out brief the second stage Delta P issue. Roger LD net one. LD one. MD net one. MD one. Proceed AC. Okay, team uh, evaluated a little further, recognized we were uh, close to the uh, top of the uh, limit. We have recommended a uh, new topping target and also the disabling of line item 272 on RLM. And with that, uh, we uh, recommend proceeding. Roger, and that to new topping target is set now, correct? That is correct. Roger. LD con LC concurs. LD. LD concurs. MD. MD concurs. RLM LC. Go ahead. Please disable line item 272. Roger, in work. So, sounds like they're still working on it. Line item 272 is disabled and verified in the program. Roger. Okay, so... Looks like they don't have any reset on a time yet until they figure out if that issue is fully resolved. Sounds like they're trying it again at this point, and hopefully we'll see if the issue gets resolved tonight. Um, check ULA Twitter. I will check ULA Twitter. LCLD on one. Go LD. Yes, sir. Please coordinate a new T0 of 23 colon 52. Roger, 23 Good copy. RC, LC, net one. RCM1. Please coordinate a new T0 of 2352 Zulu. Okay. That was 2352 Zulu? Correct. So, Copy yeah, they're working on them. ALC, set the clock for 2352 Zulu. Roger. That is about 14 minutes from now. That's their new target time. It's a good thing they have that. Let me see if my clock. There we go. Amazing. So, that's. That's the time LC, they're looking ALC. for. Go ALC. Countdown clock has been set for a new T0 of 23 colon 52. We're currently at L minus 14 minutes. Roger. I think that's correct. Uh, that's that's a, my countdown clock's a little bit. It might adjust. You'll, you'll see. Minutes. But it's a little bit long by about two minutes or so. So we'll see here. Um, by the way, I, I noticed when I when I checked my phone quick, I already have two emails helping me understand how Ireland does not fit into the UK. I learned my lesson to never <laughs> show my ignorance on international geography again on camera. Uh, this is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. As you just heard, the team has established a new T zero of 7.52 p.m. Eastern time. Dang. All right, so my countdown clock's... Oh, wait, here we go. Mine seems about right-ish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. LC, RC, oh. net one. Go RC. The new T0 of 2-3, colon 5-2 has been coordinated and approved by the range. Roger. Okay, all personnel, our clocks are set. We have an approved T0. Just under L minus 13 minutes. Yep. We'll pick up the status check at L minus seven minutes. So five minutes until we have a real true status check. I'm sounded like they were still working that issue, but maybe um who knows? Maybe they're going on that backup plan they had because they kind of talked about we're going to disable a few things and, and read from a different monitor or something. I I don't exactly know. I'm totally paraphrasing, but there might be something where they have like a subsystem that's still acceptable or a, another limit that's acceptable that they're maybe just going to say as long as this stays acceptable, we're going to push through. Um, Sometimes they have things like that where it's like, this is ideal. We can still operate within this range or this temperature or this pressure or whatever.
But if that gets breached, then we automatically like boom, it'll it'll call hold, it'll trigger a hold. So we might be within that set of range ish, something like that. I don't know the exact specifics of what's going on, um, but they're pushing through 11 minutes from now. We'll actually in about four minutes on we'll, we'll figure it out. So, um, yeah. So, uh, again, thank you, Micah, Jason. Thank you, Jeffrey Tripp. How come you always seems to have the most? That's right. Uh, that's where we were. Um, they just honestly aren't flying as often these days. So a lot, of, quite frankly, some of these boosters have sat around. LC, RD, RC on uh, net one. Go RC. Tedris is uh, right at this time, unable to support mandatory telemetry collection. We are no go for Tedris. Roger. Expected uh, resolution is beyond our currently planned T0. No. Copy. Hmm. That's weird. It's this is still a delay. This is not a full scrub. They just said it won't. They didn't say it won't be able to handle support within the window. They said within the current T zero. So they're probably gonna have to refine a new T zero time. Um, I forget. Yeah. The oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. The tracking and data relay satellites um, are currently unable to support for whatever reason. Uh, this exact T minus zero. So they are not able to use this T zero, but again, they have one hour and and 20 ish, some minutes left in this window. So if they can get support back from Tedris, um, you know, if they can get back into that, the, the tracking and data relay satellites, if they can offer support again, uh, there might just be a, I don't, I don't know what causes support or not being able to support a launch from Tedris. I have no idea <laughs> what constraints that has, but um, we'll see if there's an opportunity where it, that they can support it. And then hopefully a new T zero can support that. So let's scratch this countdown clock again until we hear something new. Um, this, and so this goes back to your question, Jeffrey Tripp, how come ULA seems to have the most issues? I wouldn't call them issues because they have a hundred percent reliability with their vehicles. Um, we might just, we see that they aren't flying as often. So it does seem like they have scrubs. Um, as their hardware, again, literally, they just, they aren't as fluid. They aren't as well-oiled. This well is Delta Mission Control at T-minus four minutes and holding. An issue with NASA's tracking and data relay satellite system, which provides mandatory collection of Delta IV ascent data, will relay will delay liftoff beyond our new 7.52 p.m. Eastern launch time. So... We'll see if the if Tedris comes back online, or if it's able to support it, or again, whatever issue is currently happening with Tedris, it sounds like it is mandatory for launch. So we're not going anywhere tonight without uh, the support of the tracking relay and data satellites, which again, this that's not that has nothing to do with with ULA. Um, that this could happen to any launch provider. So again, to answer your question. I think the main reason we do see additional delays and holds lately from ULA is they just aren't as well oiled of, of a machine. Um, and quite frankly, their the commercial uh, section of payloads and customers has shrunk a lot due to um, competition eating away at some of their some of their their launches. You know, specifically SpaceX has taken almost all commercial launches these days, um, which bites into ULA's um, launch cadence. You know, so. They just they they aren't as well oiled as they were at one point. They're seeing fewer launches than they have in the past, so you would expect some of these things to kind of pop up at time to time. Um, when I was out of the Delta II pad to see OCO2, it had been a long time since the Delta II had launched. So far to the point that the hydraulics that moved the the launch tower were seized shut, and so was a um, so was a water valve, the the sound suppression valve. Um, was seized shut as well. Again, just basically from not being used as often as as other pads. That so there's there's a mixture between using a pad very often has one set of uh, you know and, and a system has one set of LD, challenges. LD LC net one. LD on one. Yeah, with the uh, issue reported by uh, RC with the uh, Tetris uh, forty one issue, I recommend extending a hold at this time. LD concur. All right, team. Uh, 
monitor all your systems, launch vehicle readiness uh, prepared. We'll allow the uh, range team to work the uh, issue and uh, look for a successful resolution of that and pick a T0 within our window. Okay, we will see. Ooh, dang, T Wolf RX7 in our Discord channel. This is first off, T Wolf. I don't welcome. I don't. I don't think I've ever seen you in our Discord channel. Thank you for joining. Um, and I love RX7s. That's actually always been one of my favorite cars. I love the rotary engine. Super cool. Although very polluty, so now I'm a little more on the electric train. But always been a fan of the you know 13B, 20B. So sweet. Um, yeah, so Tidris, uh, T Wolf RX7 in our Discord channel says, Tidris currently has a gap in tracking coverage over the flight path and should have full tracking back in place within 30 minutes. This is news to me, and this is uh, why I love our Discord channel, because they are very, very smart. Uh, we have people from all over the world and tons of different industries. This is, These are the people that I tap into for research all the time, where I'm like, guys, I know nothing about uh, chemistry. Who can help me out? And all of a sudden, somebody's like, well, I'm actually working on a chemistry paper right now on this almost exact topic so if you ever think it sounds like i have, have a lot of knowledge i don't have a lot of knowledge i have an amazing community that has a lot of knowledge that helps me um teaches me things and then i find it my job to help you know be able to communicate that that's what i enjoy doing is the communication aspects and trying to cram it all up in this brain to try to remember it uh when you're <laughs> talking about rockets and stuff but uh i i i hope i say this often enough that i, I wouldn't be uh, the channel wouldn't be nearly as well-rounded uh, as it is without the help of my Discord channel. And of course, uh, we our Discord channel is available through Patreon. So if you want to become a Patreon supporter to help me do what I do, uh, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. That is how you get into our, yeah, you know, that is how you get into our Discord channel. And I love my patrons and I love my Discord channel. It's an awesome community. So thank you guys. Friendly reminder. Let's keep going here. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Jeffrey Tripp. Patricia, uh, just Google it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, and now I'm getting the Ireland debate. So I'm I'm about 30 minutes behind on answering questions. Sorry about that. Cathal, Ireland is its own government. Nothing to do with the UK. Ireland is British. Ireland not British. Ireland is in the British Isles. See, I knew you could classify it as something. Like I knew, I know that Ireland is its own country. But I knew it was also classified in something. It is a British island, right? Uh, at least according to... Uh, we better not get back into this. We better not get back into this. That's where trouble happens. <laughs> Thanks, funny nut guy. Corona Kivo. Hey, everyday astronaut. Corona, good to see you. Good to Thank you for your donation. I like you. Come Quat Lord. The collective is the British ILC. Boom, 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 boom. I knew it. Um, Tony Reedman, my opinion on Brexit. <laughs> I can't even tell you... Apparently, what Ireland belongs to and it's re how it's related to. Th if I don't have a good sense of that, I don't have any kind of scope to have any proper opinion on Brexit. So, <laughs> totally staying out of that. AMG Wagon. Maybe see Skyline Saber Dev Facility. That would be sweet. I would go uh, I would go to, uh, to the UK just to see uh, the Skyline engines, uh, that really cool Saber engine. That would be sweet. It'd be like Kerbal Space Program in real life. I really am curious. I know they've invested a lot in there in in that new facility out there. I would love to see how that. This is, is Delta Mission along. Control at T minus four minutes and holding. The range is working a tracking satellite issue that is a requirement for launch. The Delta Four is currently ready to launch and awaits a resolution and new T zero. The window tonight extends to nine o five Eastern time. The venerable, Del the venerable Delta family of rockets have been launching into space for decades. Let's take a look at the amazing history of the Delta rocket. Okay, so they're doing this. We'll, we'll keep, this is just gonna be music probably. We'll let this play in the background here. Um, oh, that is, by the way, this is my favorite launch pad, I think, in the United States. I know everyone loves 39A, but it's actually this one, Slick 6E which is the, it's out in Vandenberg Air Force Base. You saw that the big mobile building move out. This site right here, A, it's gorgeous. It's freaking gorgeous. Look at that. You have the mountains 
and you have this cool building. But my favorite part about it is not only this is the only site in the world that twice was supposed to have people launch from the West Coast, which means that people would have gone into polar orbit because when you launch from the West Coast, you go into a polar orbit. When you launch from the East Coast, you're not going to a polar orbit. You're going to some kind of, you know, eastwardly uh, trajectory. So um, the thing that I love about the the West Coast launch site is that it's supposed to launch the Mole uh, program, which was going to be launching on a Titan 2 Heavy or Titan 4 Heavy, something crazy with a Gemini, like a Gemini B capsule. Super cool. And then that got scrapped as it was pretty far along in development, too. That got scrapped. And then the space shuttle was literally like months away from launching from there. And then Challenger happened and it totally made everyone reconsider the space shuttle safety. And they were literally like super close to launching the space shuttle from that launch pad. There's even pictures of them like they did a full all up test with I believe it was Enterprise, the the non-flight worthy um, shuttle orbiter, you know, it was, or as a flight test it was basically a glider test, but it wasn't. It never flew in, into space, um, but it was Enterprise was out there on a full stack. They had it all up there. It looked just gorgeous. If you see pictures from Slick 6E like that with the space shuttle on it, it looks so much like alternate history. It's super, super cool. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I, I love seeing that pad. Anyway, I love all this old – I've not seen some of this footage. I'm probably going to have to – I wonder if they have this on their channel because this is some – Pretty cool footage. But let's keep answering your guys' questions because I am over 30 minutes behind on answering them. Spacing out. Hey, Tim. Me and my pops went to uh, went to DM1, both our first launches. We watch you all the time, and yesterday was his birthday. Could you give him a shout-out? His name is Randy. Thanks a ton. Randy, happy birthday. Uh, hopefully, you get a candle lit just the day after your birthday. Uh, congrats on seeing your first launch. DM1 was a lot of fun. It was a gorgeous night launch. Um, I'm glad you guys were able to make it down to a launch. If you, if you ever get the chance, if you have the smallest desire to go see a launch in person, try and make it happen. It really is magical. Something changes, something clicks. You realize it's very humbling to see a vehicle with so much raw power, how big of a vehicle it takes to put something so tiny, just, just up there, just, just outside, just, ugh, it takes so much power to break free of Earth's gravity. And it's, it's really humbling. It's a really beautiful experience. Um, yeah, I highly recommend it if you ever have the chance. So uh, so happy birthday, Randy. Everyone in, in chat, say happy birthday, Randy. Samuel, greetings from Switzerland. Mm, I do love myself some Switzerland. Uh, Kaylee A, Ireland used to be part of Great Britain, but they declared independence. You're better at rockets than you are at geography and history. Well, I know about Bloody Sunday. Like, I understand. I know the difference. I just didn't know how. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but thank you, Tim, come to dry Doddington. Where is dry Doddington? Because I think I need to go to dry Doddington. I'm going to look that up. I'm going to make plans to go find dry Doddington. There is a Dodd bridge road, I believe in Colorado. Um, every time I go out to Denver, drive right over or across or nearby to Dodd bridge road. I should probably find dry Doddington, uh, Donald Saunders. Uh, keep up the good work, Tim. Thank you, Donald. Uh, and also thank you, Harry. I don't think I said Haley. And also thank you, Kaylee. I don't know if I said thank you. Uh, Krunu Suter. Any word on SpaceX spacesuit jackets? Uh, Krunu. If those of you that uh, don't follow me on Twitter or Instagram, first do. If, if, you're, if, you, if you use those platforms, come find me. Uh, you probably just can search Everyday Astronaut. Uh, that's definitely what I am on Instagram. Unfortunately, Twitter, Everyday Astronaut is too long, so I am Erday Astronaut. But if you search Everyday Astronaut, you'll probably find me. Uh, yeah, come follow me. I do have pictures up. I was wearing a SpaceX-style spacesuit, like hoodie. It was a hoodie that looks and is cut just like the SpaceX spacesuit. Um, those will be up in my store in a couple months. I don't really have a good timeline on it. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, they will be fantastic. And yeah, I, uh, I'm excited to have them in there because it's, it's, they're, they're really cool. They're really, really cool. So, so yeah, stay tuned. I'll let you know when. Uh, Tony, and thank you. Uh, Tony, your opinion on first launch of SpaceX Dragon 2. My opinion was that it was awesome. It was flawless. I mean, I talk about it quite a bit. Uh, people were asking, like, where have you been the past week? I did, like, four guest appearances on, on different things, including... Um, I've done two guest appearances on my favorite 
Space News show tomorrow. So if you're not following tomorrow, I feel like I talk about them all the time, but they're definitely one of the, they're really good friends of mine. They do a fantastic production, but it's spelled T M R O to tomorrow, like tomorrow T M R O find them on YouTube. Uh, you can find my opinions about SpaceX's DM one. I talk about it pro both like pre launch or pre splashdown. And then I did another one this week talking about the splashdown aspect of it. Uh, and the recovery, it was a flawless mission. I also talk about it a lot on my podcast. I do a podcast with two other YouTubers called Our Ludicrous Future. We talk about futurism. We talk a lot of, I talk about space. And then um, we talk about like EVs and electric vehicles and, and kind of renewable energy and things like that. We just kind of talk about the future. Ooh, look at that, a Delta Three. That's rare. That's a very rare rocket. So weird. It's basically a Delta Two and a Delta Four put together. It's, it's a really funny vehicle. It always lit with with nine SRBs like that. Um, but yeah, I talk I talk a ton about DM1, like for <laughs> 10, 20 minutes about DM1 um, on our Ludic our Ludicrous Future. So that's available here on YouTube. Um, you can search our Ludicrous Future or pull up your, your phone right now and, and find your favorite podcasting app and look for our Ludicrous Future. Good luck spelling Ludicrous. I never know how to spell it. If I say it Ludi Kraus, sometimes I can kind of eventually get there. Um, after spell correct, autocorrect takes the rest for me, but Ludi Kraus, our ludicrous future. Definitely subscribe right now. If you want to hear that's, I talked about it there. Also was, I also did a, a, a guest spot on, um, off nominal podcast with the, uh, with Jake and Anthony. Jake does, um, we Martians podcast and Anthony does Miko main, main engine cutoff podcast. They also have another side show called, um, called off nominal. I, I sat and talked with them for about a full hour or longer even, um, about DM1. So if you want my opinion on DM1 and how great it was, all the experience, I've talked about it until my face is blue. So hopefully those are good resources if you want to hear me talk way too much about it. Uh, so thank you, Tony. Um, Jason, your opinions on NASA's determination to seek a commercial rocket to launch Orion. Jason, I touched on this for a second. Um, actually, I talk about this for about 20 or 30 minutes again on, on what I think the Our Ludicrous Future episode will come out tonight or tomorrow, the podcast. I, I talk about it a lot with Joe Scott from Answers with Joe. We just sit and we hash it all out. Um, I talked about it a little bit at the beginning of this broadcast, so if you need another rundown. But my my quick my quick little – my quip is that um, even though they say – a lot of people are running the numbers. There's a lot of cool people like Robot Beat on Twitter. Um, the subreddits are going nuts with this stuff. Scott Manley's going nuts trying to figure this out it there's it almost has to be two falcon heavies uh in order to really do what one sls could have done let's see if they're gonna give us an update here after that that was a nice long film though let's let's see where we're at here maybe 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 they'll okay i'll keep talking um let's see they, did they give us a tweet update? Because I will definitely check in on that too. Nope, nothing nothing since that last one. So hopefully the, the Tedra system is ready to support them here. We are waiting for those just now tuning in. They first had a hold because of a, a out of sensor, like out of family sensor reading or some kind of over, not ideal sensor in their hydraulic system of the upper stage. Um, they kind of change modes and feel confident launching now or something is okay to go. They're still within um, an acceptable limit. Um, but then once that was resolved and they got a new T0 times up, now we're waiting on... Um, no, I have not muted the audio. There's just nothing going on. <laughs> I raised it back up. Um, the uh, Now we're waiting on a new T0 time where they the tracking and, and relay data satellites are able to track and relay data uh, from the rocket. So that has to be acceptable too. Um, it seems like it was kind of out of phase for a second. So hopefully we get an update here that says that they are good to go. Um, one second here. Nope. That's not an update. Um, that's funny. Now, now my discord's going crazy showing me all these cool places named Dodd. <laughs> Apparently there's a ton of like, uh, Newark, uh, Newark in the UK. Interesting. Um, Cedar Avenue and Doddington. That's crazy. Illuminati confirmed. So yeah, so that's where we're at with hopefully this thing maybe launching. And Jason, to answer your question, I think it's extremely interesting that they're considering commercial 
launches for Orion. Now, don't forget, Orion and its service module are really heavy. Yes, Orion flew on top of a Delta IV Heavy, and it took a Delta IV Heavy just to get Orion, not with without its service full service module. It wasn't an all-up unit, out to a pretty elliptical orbit. Um, but really, in order to put something, you know, I think only Falcon Heavy has the true low Earth orbit payload capability to launch the Orion capsule and its European service module into low Earth orbit. And it has to do it in expendable mode. It cannot recover any of the boosters. That would be a very sad Falcon Heavy, but a really cool one because it it would have a, an Orion capsule on top. A huge, you know, the Orion capsule is huge, way bigger than Dragon and Starliner and way bigger than Apollo. Um, Starliner and Apollo are, are actually fairly similar in size. Um, but then when you see it compared to Orion, Orion is a big, big capsule. Um, totally deep space rated. It is a different beast than Dragon 2 and then Starliner. Um, yeah, it's so seeing it launch on top of a Falcon Heavy, even expendable, would be awesome. And then you would have to still send up a kick stage. Um, and in order for them to really do anything like that, it would take a pretty serious development. I have very much doubt that they could actually get it done by the end of 2020, which is what they're currently aiming for is a, um, EF to get EM or wait, EM one exploration mission one of Orion. They want to get it out to lunar orbit within before the end of 2020. That would be a very lofty goal considering they'd have to figure out a way to rendezvous and dock. This with is the Delta stage. mission control at T minus four minutes and holding. I'm now joined by John Gatorowski, who last minute has agreed to come in and talk to us about TDRS and their capabilities Ooh, good. and why they're important. So yeah, thanks Andrea. Um, so the, the TDRS satellite constellation is an important asset because we use that to track the rocket and the spacecraft during the ascent and, uh, and during the vehicle uh, liftoff through the the tracking of the of the vehicle all the way until the spacecraft is separated so so the Tetris constellation is is a mandatory coverage off of hmm. I wonder if that They may have had a some kind of audio issue there. We'll see if they can bring that back on. You know, sometimes when you last minute throw a plug a mic in, it's hard to tell what exactly you're gonna get. Maybe cable goes bad. Welcome to audio. So we just got new yeah. oh. new word. Oh, they're probably getting updates. That the teacher satellite system may be back up and running. Yes. So team's still working an issue now. We can maintain our coverage and and get the Delta Four ready to fly again soon. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, John. That's good news. So hopefully we'll hear a, a new T0 time. And as soon as we get that, we'll be able to pop up our T0 countdown up here. Again, the one that you're seeing up on screen in the top left uh, over here, I should just use the mouse. <laughs> this is the planned hold. Um, so that is not indicative of when the actual launch is. We're now at a planned hold where the vehicle's safe and can sit here for hours like this. And then it's up to ULA um, and the, the range and the, the customer to really determine when to actually hit go, basically. And when they hit go, then it's then you'll see the T minus four minutes start counting down. Um, so this is a planned hold, but, you know, we're, we're still within. We have one hour of window left. So hopefully that new T minus zero time gets they, they give it to us and we know what's going on here any minute. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm starting to feel more confident it, you know, they've had some time to work some issues. If Teters is back online and ready to go, hopefully, uh, yeah. So, and sounds like he was probably all of a sudden receiving updates on Teters, and that's why all of a sudden he just stopped talking because he wanted to make sure that he was hearing what's going on. So, um, ooh, Andrew Kaler wants to know, uh, can we get some twilight effect on this launch? If the sun did just go down in Florida, if it launches in the next like five or 10 minutes, there is a chance you'll see the twilight phenomena. And actually um, on the, on the East coast sunsets, wait, wait, East coast sunrises would be the, the more brilliant uh, twilight effect, a twilight phenomenon. That's where um, when the rocket takes off, if it's dark on the ground, but you know, the sun just rose or set or LCRC whatever. net one. Oh, here we go. Go RC. Yeah. For the team's, uh, 
essay, uh, the uh, the Tedris testing is going to take a little bit longer. It looks like it'll be till zero zero one two Zulu uh, before they have a full status for us. Roger, but they are making grounds on uh, potentially getting us uh, the asset we need. Yes, they're in the middle of uh, transitioning. They they they've uh, successfully, I believe, transitioned to their SA two antenna, and they've got a test schedule that that should complete at that time. Roger, just a waiting retest. Yes, sir. Thank you for the update. Cool. Well, not not giving up yet. So it sounds like they kind of have to establish a new link with Tedris. If that goes well, um, the tracking relay and data satellites, as long as that all goes well and that system's up online and running, then once that's all confirmed to be good to go, they can set a new 2-0. Hopefully we'll see this thing take off. Again, um, we do have uh, about 59 minutes left in, in, their, in their window. So we will see... Um, that's a good question, JKRP. Let me, let me finish answering some of these questions here. Um, so we were talking about Orion and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I don't remember what else we were talking about, but we'll keep, we'll keep going here. Thank you, Jason, for your question. Um, Christian. Hey, Tim, once again, watching your stream inside before walking outside right before launch to see it live. Hopefully I am. That does make me just a little jealous. The, the people of Florida are definitely blessed by being able to, See rockets just take off in your backyard or front yard or or side yard or, you know, maybe you don't have a yard and you're like in a condo or something. Actually, uh, I met a guy at the meetup that uh, him and his wife, they, their balcony is looking really close right over the Max Brewer Bridge. Like probably about as good of a viewing point as you can get for, a you know, if you have a uh, if you live somewhere, you can just like open up your blinds and just watch a rocket launch or sit out on your patio. That's pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. That does sound pretty fantastic. That would actually be a cool place to, to like, I'm surprised no one, you know, like when ULA and SpaceX do these broadcasts, actually, I guess NASA did it for the DM one mission where they actually had like a patio basically. And the, the presenters were actually talking with the rocket in the background. I'm surprised it's not more common that we don't see, you know, someone having like a, a studio 10 miles away or something. Um, yeah. Good luck, Christian. Hopefully we do see it tonight. And maybe there's, oh, I remember I was talking about the twilight phenomenon. Um, maybe we'll see that tonight. But again, so if um, if it's pre-dawn and it's still, you know, it's before sunrise on the East Coast and the rocket takes off, the rocket will end up being illuminated by the sun from behind because, you know, the sun rises in the East. So then that means you'd all of a sudden see the the exhaust plume will light up it's really brilliant it's very pretty um the prettiest ones though on the east coast obviously like i just said are this are is in, delta in the mission morning. control at t-minus four minutes and holding a status update from the tedris network is expected shortly okay <laughs> what is involved Roger, CBC both uh, locks and hydrogen and second stage hydrogen the uh second stage locks is getting cycled now roger Cool. AC, um, LC, net one. AC on one. Yeah, so properly it is recommending uh, performing valve cycles. I concur with that. Any, uh, any reaction from you or BSC? Stand by. Again, they have 55 minutes basically left in their window. So... Hopefully any issues they're working get settled. I'll say this AC. Uh, we agree with the recommendation. Roger. I missed the recommendation. <laughs> Was it to cycle their oxygen or what? PO1, LC, that one. Go ahead. You ready to proceed with uh, a drain valve sec test? Roger. Proceed. Box one. Go. You ready to proceed? Ready. Proceed. And field two. Field two. You ready to proceed with a uh, foundry and valve cycle test? Ready. Proceed. Okay. Sounds like they're doing some kind of cycle test or recycling something. It might be recycling the oxygen tanks or something. Um, but it sounds like they're prepping that test now. And then I assume based on the results from that, they'll be able to establish whether or not they're good to launch. And then if they are, they'll establish a new T0 time. We'll get a proper countdown clock going back up. 
And hopefully we'll know what's going to happen tonight. If we're going to see this thing go off tonight, I really hope we do. Valve cycle test. <laughs> um, all right. So let's, so again, Twilight Phenomenon, uh, if it were to go off like right now, it might be able to see a Twilight Phenomenon, but it wouldn't be as pretty as the ones uh, in the morning on the East Coast. West Coast are the ones where if the sun just set, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes or whatever after the sun sets, the rocket takes off, the rocket goes up, and then it's backlit illuminated because you're looking west, the rocket is west, the sun is west, so it illuminates it from behind. Those are the really pretty Twilight Phenomenons. Um, but the um, the on the East Coast, the morning ones are the prettier ones. So that's, yeah, there we go. Um, so S Scott, thank you very much. Whoa. Thank you, Scott. Jeez. I am 40 minutes late to seeing this. Uh, if you're still around, <laughs> thank you so much. Seriously. Uh, that means a this ton. is Delta mission control at T minus four minutes and holding the thank launch you. team is postured to resume the countdown. Once the tracking network is confirmed, ready to support tonight's flight. All right. Still hope, still hope. Um, but dang, again, thank you so much, Scott. The Stig. <laughs> what? <laughs> I love the Stig. You got me. You got me already. What country do I believe will reach Mars first? I don't think it's going to be a country this time. I think Mars will be an international collaboration. I think it'd be unlikely that a single country at this point in, in where we're at, you know, seeing how Gateway and International Space Station has panned out. Um, Gateway is another example where we're seeing JAXA involved. We're seeing Canada involved. We're seeing Roscosmos and Russia involved. You know, we're seeing the United States and ESA. Uh, it's an international collaboration just to get a potential uh, lunar orbiting gateway, uh, a, basically a space station around the moon. That's international. And I think my guess would be Mars is such a big endeavor, in, in Denver, endeavor that it will require an international collaboration. I would love for it to require that. I would love for it to definitely. Uh, my only hope with, with Mars is that it's not a touchdown with just astronauts from one country. I would really, really love for it to be um, multiple countries one. representing Go multiple one. nations. Valve cycle test is complete. Roger. LC locks one. Go. Valve cycle test complete. Roger. LC fuel two. Go. Valve cycle test is complete. Roger. Sweet. That's a good sign. Here we go. For this one's for Delta Corn Medium. Let's see how this goes, guys. Uh, I'm I'm expecting to hear hear an update any second, but we have not yet. So I'll keep I'll keep going. Um, yeah. So so Mars. I really hope it's international. I hope it represents um, people from all around the world, different cultures. Um, different, you know, nationalities and, and beliefs and, and that, it, that when humans step foot on Mars, that it's, it's way more international, uh, than just flags and footprints that like, like the United States did on the moon. Um, I, I but one thing to remember with even the United States and, and the moon race, you know, we came for all mankind, uh, in peace. Like to me, that's still, uh, I would like to see that exemplified even more in a bigger international collaboration. I would also love if like the elevator would, however they lower is like a circle and all the astronauts from all the different countries could all step off at once. So there's like 12 footprints all touching Martian soil simultaneously. I think that would be really cool. Uh, or something, maybe like a piggyback system or something where everyone's um, physically, I don't know. So I, I don't, I don't have the logistics figured out yet or maybe cause I, you know, unfortunately for, for buzz, he really touched down on the moon at the exact same time as Neil, but Neil kind of got all the glory because his foot touched the ground first. Um, but I would love for it if instead of being like, who is the first human on Mars? You have to, you have to memorize 12 people's names. Now that would be cool. Um, there are more than 12. I know there's more than 12 countries, but I don't think there's going to be 199. <laughs> Here we go back into geography. 179 or however many countries there are currently. Uh, I don't think there's going to be that many people physically able to ever step off of a vehicle on the surface of Mars simultaneously. I'm just logistically, my guess would be a Mars, the first Mars missions will be around anywhere from five to 20 people um, would be my guess. So that's why I said 12. <laughs> um, LC, LD on one. Here we go. Go. 
Yes, sir. Please coordinate a new T0 of 00, zero colon 26. Roger, 0026. Zero, zero, Good copy. Okay. RC, LC, that one? RC and one. Please coordinate a new T0 of 00, zero colon 26, colon 000. Zero, zero. Roger, and work. <laughs> ALC, LC, net one. Go ahead. Please set the clock for new T0 zero, 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 two, six, zero, zero, zero. Roger. Cool. So we're still going for it. This is good. Um, so yeah, so let's let's keep going here. Uh, here we go. Uh -huh. Okay, so there you go, the Stig. Long answer. Uh, Nick, and thank you, uh, Nikita. Um, that is some beautiful. Uh, LC ALC. Script oh, unfortunately. Countdown clock has been set with a new T zero of zero zero colon twenty six Zulu. We're at L minus ten minutes. Roger. LC RC net one. Go RC. Range is approved. New T zero 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 two six Zulu. Roger. L minus ten minutes. All communications switch to channel one. All personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch. Maintain operational silence in the LCC. LDM. <laughs> Someone's ordering some pizza real quick. And, and uh, LC, we have a recommendation due to the uh, delay. We need to adjust the uh, second stage delta P one more time. Value has been uh, recommended by the anomaly team. Roger. And uh, LC concurs. LD. LD concurs. MD. MD concur. Okay. And that was four decimal two zero, correct? Seven two zero. Roger. And locks two, you you uh, copy that recommendation. I copy and it's complete. Roger. Sweet. Okay, team. Oh, is that the okay team? <laughs> That's all we get. CRC net one. Go RC. Yeah, TDRS is operational and able to support the new T zero. Roger. Okay, team. Our new uh, T zero has been coordinated and approved. Zero zero two six. And uh, we'll pick up with the status check at L minus seven minutes. Sweet. All right, this is looking good, guys. So yeah, my my timer's pretty much on, pretty much dead on. So yeah, I'm excited. Um, so thank you, Nikita. I really wish I could read that. Um, thank you very much for your generous. This is Delta tip. Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. As you just heard, the TDRS constraint has been cleared. A new launch time of 8.26 p.m. Eastern Time has been identified. I hope we get into the terminal count. That'd be great. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. The team will pull in less than one minute. Um, real quick, Isaac asks, will we be able to use electricity as propulsion in the future? Of course we use that now uh, with ion and xeon and hall thrusters. Um, the problem is it doesn't work uh, <laughs> in an atmosphere, uh, and it's very, very low thrust to weight ratio. So it only works in space. And unfortunately, the laws of physics and, and the extremely light uh, molecular weight of ion and xeon and, and basically using electricity as propulsion um, prevents it from being used as a ground-based propulsion system. Um, it's a good question. It's extremely efficient. And we're working on making them more powerful and higher thrust to weight ratios to make them. This is Delta Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. Make them better. Let's listen in as Scott Barney performs a final pulling of the launch team. Status check to proceed with terminal count. First aid systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Second stage systems, locks. Go. LH2. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Com. Go. GCQ. Go. Operations support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Hazgas. Go. ECS. 
Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ELA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. This is EMD. You have permission to launch. Yes. Proceeding with the count. L minus six minutes. MEQ, establish swing arm lock pins pulled. Roger, and work. Cool. It's looking good. I told you guys, sometimes you just never know. Right up until almost, not quite the last minute yet, but this is looking good. I really, really hope we don't have any issues here in the terminal count. I would love to see this thing go off tonight. Um, meanwhile, while well, we got a little Pulling bit more time. is complete oh. and the launch team is given a go for launch. The countdown will resume in approximately two minutes from now. At T minus four minutes and counting, the team will enter the terminal count and will begin securing the second stage liquid oxygen tank. At T minus 332, booster liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tank securing is started which includes closing the propellant fill and drain valves. Also at T minus 332, vehicle transfer from ground facility power to its own internal battery power will be complete. At T minus three minutes, the vehicle ordnance system will be armed and the booster liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen propellant tanks are verified to be at flight pressure and flight level. At two minutes prior to liftoff, the team will verify that the hydraulic system is pressurized as well as confirm booster, DCSS, flight termination, and battery voltages. At T minus 120, the team will begin securing the second stage liquid hydrogen tank. At T minus 60 seconds, the eastern range readiness is verified. At T minus 50 seconds, the DCSS liquid hydrogen tank is secured at flight level. A final launch vehicle and spacecraft status check is conducted at T minus 30 seconds. At T minus 15 seconds, the ROFIs, or sparklers, are ignited to burn off excess hydrogen at the base of the vehicle. 59. Second stage lock secure at flight level. Ground pyros in There we go. We are in T under T minus four minutes, we are out of a hold. This is good. This the is good. The countdown clock is resumed and we are go for launch at 8.26 p.m. Eastern Time. All right. Good job, Andrea. I think this is her first time hosting ULA. Hopefully... She's having a good time too. It's it's fun seeing new uh, presenters on ULA. They've uh, they've it's been fun to see them change their hosting Three style recently, which is which is cool. So there we go. I, yeah, T minus three minutes, guys. I'm gonna hold off and answer your guys' questions um, when we get into that. We have a, a, a ways to go in this stream tonight, actually. Still, FTS internal. Because they have a coast phase. <laughs> this, this will be a long stream, so I'll, I'll try to get caught up with you guys. BBC locks at flight pressure and flight level. It's looking good. So, uh, how are you guys? <laughs> you guys ready to see a rocket launch? I really hope this thing goes off, especially again, I talk about this all the time, but like when you are a launch photographer and you're trying to capture launches like this, it makes it um, very difficult. Scrubs are really, really, they take a toll. So Two minutes, 159. Vehicle internal. My dog press at 155. So to my friends that are going to provide awesome pictures of this, best of luck to you too. Especially, and tourists, I think we're probably coming up on... This has got to be, you know, like spring break time. And, and CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. 140. FCS yeah. launch and 37. Probably a lot of people watching tonight from the from the Cape. You know, I think about it. It's a Friday night. 
T minus 90 seconds. The launch Perfect vehicle, time. payload, ground systems, and each Zern range are go for launch. 120. We'll see who's armed. FCS count start. Remember, guys, we're going to see a big old fireball at about T minus seven seconds go up the side of the vehicle. They write, light their, I think they're called rofies. They're, they're giant sparklers that will burn off the excess hydrogen as they start to spin up the hydrogen pumps and, and hydrogen. T pump. minus one minute. Let's go. Inside the end. Rock, report range status. Range green. Yes. 50. Here we go. So you'll see the Next engine light up. To secure at flight level. A good uh, se seven seconds or so. Status check. Go Delta. Go WGS-10. Yes. 23. SRM TVC blowdown. 15. Rofi ignition. All right, so there's those sparklers. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, mm, that's normal. 2, 1. And yes. we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket Whoa, carrying the WGS 10 mission for the United States Air Force. Boy, those SRBs really kick it off the pad. seconds into flight. Our chamber pressure looks good. Yeah, good chamber pressure. Good performance on the RS 68A engine. Now wow. coming up on 30 seconds. That's a solid 34 record. seconds into flight. Mach 1 Delta 4 is now supersonic. Supersonic already? SRM chamber pressure has tailed off from the max pressure as expected. Continue to see good uh, engine performance on the RS 68 engine. Man, it seems like that thing just Delta shot off is now man. passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Now 55 seconds into flight. Continue to see good performance on the RS-68A engine. Good performance on all four SRMs. Nice symmetric burn. Now one minute, five seconds into flight. About 30 seconds remaining until SRM burnout. Solid rocket motors, they call them solid rocket motors. Instead of SRBs, they call now them Now passing SRMs. one minute, 15 seconds into flight. Man. Continue to see good performance on the main engine. A normal, a Delta IV Heavy just lumbers And standing off the by pad. for SRM burnout shortly. Because it doesn't have any of those powerful SRBs. It just is efficient hydrogen engines slowly lifting it off. This thing just, bye-bye. And we have burnout on all four SRMs standing by for jettison. Okay, you'll see four blobs shoot off. There's two and then another two. And we have good indication of jettison of all four solid rocket motors. Good. Main engine continuing to perform well. Chamber pressure looks good. That's Passing cool. one minute, 50 seconds into flight. Vehicle's gone to closed loop guidance. So you're seeing the, the Delta IV rocket now weighs just one half of its liftoff weight, burning propellant at a rate of almost 2,000 pounds per second. You're seeing those solid rocket boosters. Now two minutes into flight, the second stage ACS system press valve has been opened. System pressure response looks good. And seeing good body rates on the Delta IV as it transitioned to closed loop guidance. Main engine continuing to perform well. Engine parameters look good. Now two minutes, 18 seconds into flight. Launch vehicle is now 46 miles in altitude, 73 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,400 miles per hour. Uh, that's about. Continue to see good performance on the main now. engine, passing two minutes, 35 seconds into flight. A little faster than 8,000 kilometers an hour for those of you that don't live in the United States <laughs> or Myanmar. And body rates have uh, nulled out now, two minutes, 45 seconds in. And the upper stage flock system has begun the boost phase chill down sequence to begin thermal conditioning of the RL-10 engine. Now two minutes remaining in the boost phase of flight. So again, remember, you'll see the payload fairing come off during first stage ignition. So first stage is still going, and then you see the payload fairing pop off. And upper off. stage fuel system has begun boost phase chill down. Standing by for payload fairing jettison. And we have good indication of payload fairing jettison. Sweet. Bye-bye.
Thanks for doing your job. Approximately 20 seconds remaining until booster begins to throttle down in preparation for BECO, continuing to see good um, chamber pressure on the RS-68A engine. Fun fact, they call their first stage the booster engine, so they'll say BECO instead of main now engine. Now three minutes, off. 40 seconds into flight, standing by for booster throttle down momentarily. And then though they consider the RL-10 on the upper stage their main engine, which I think is interesting. I mean, technically... And the booster's now throttling down in preparation for BECO, standing by for BECO. And we have BECO booster engine cutoff, standing by for stage separation. Their animation. And we have good indication of stage separation. There we go. You're seeing the nozzle. extension is deploying. Drop down. How cool is that? We have pre-start on the RL-10, standing by for ignition. That's so cool. Nozzle extension. What a wacky idea. And we have ignition on the RL-10. Chamber pressure looks good. Body rates look good. This is the first burn of today's mission. This first burn will last approximately 15 minutes, 15 seconds. 15 minute now, min burn. now passing four minutes 30 seconds into flight a 15 minute upper stage burn that's how big that upper stage that five meter upper stage is with hydrogen rl10 chamber pressure continues to look good and that's the first burn body rates uh seeing us this is delta mission control at t plus four minutes and 48 seconds we've just heard patrick moore report the successful execution of the early events for tonight's flight and all systems continue to operate nominally. The Delta IV second stage and WGS satellite are traveling over the Atlantic Ocean in a southeasterly direction away from the coast of Florida. The mission is now in the first of two planned RL-10 engine burns. This burn will last approximately 15 minutes. Momentarily, we'll hear from Boeing's Tim Maurer to tell us more about the spacecraft. But first, let's take a look at a message from the Boeing team on what it's been like working on the WGS program. Do you guys want to see this or or do you guys want to keep going with questions? I'll do whatever you guys want. Um, sometimes these things people would rather have me host it live because you can always watch this later. Let's I, let's. I'll go ahead and I'll talk over this just because I know that people watch my content to be able to get their questions answered. So uh, if you want to see this, you can rewatch the official live stream. Um, and I, I think that's why people come here, right? Oh, uh, wait, I want the vid questions. See this, watch. <laughs> we get both. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll keep answering some questions. Uh, thank you, Evan. Thank you, Corona. Thoughts on Starhopper moving to the launch pad the other day? It's very exciting. Um, they're currently about to be mounting Raptor to Starhopper. Uh, I expect to see that thing hopping in probably a week or two. It's not necessarily hopping, but it's first uh, engine ignitions relatively quickly. They're moving at absolute breakneck speeds right now on the Starhopper program. Um, it's just nuts. So it's, it's fun to see how closely people are watching that stuff. Um, yeah. So let's see here. Um, that's what I think, Corona. David, is that a bit of thermal protective coating on top of the fairing, the little black blob on top? Yes, it is. It's They have a little bit of ablative coating on top of the fairing. I also noticed that the fairing 2.0 or a, a couple of the fairings on some of the Falcon 9 rockets uh, have also had a little black tip, a little bit of thermal protection system. And that's something new that I hadn't seen before. Um, let's, uh, let's see if we can tune back in here if they're going to give us any more updates on the mission. We're now joined by Boeing's Tim Maurer. Tim, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Andrea. Great. I, I know I'm really excited to learn more about WGS and what you do specifically. So to go ahead and get started, what I'd like to do first is just get to know a little bit about what you do and your involvement with the WGS program. Great. So as you mentioned, I work on the ground system for the WGS spacecraft called the Global SATCOM Configuration Control Element. I've worked on this system over various roles since 2003, very near to the initial WGS contract award in 2001. The Army uses the global SATCOM configuration control element to control the payload. So right now, I'm an integrated product team lead for the Mitigation and Anti-Jam Enhancement Program, or MAGE. Okay, I've had people say that they want me to kind of keep going here about like, answering your guys' questions. 
Uh, again, if, if you don't want to see me here on the screen, it is your choice. You are in charge of watching YouTube and you have the ability to watch the official live stream anytime you want. So, uh, yeah, I've had people be like, why is that guy down there talking? Like, you clicked on my video. What do you mean, why am I talking? Uh, so, yeah, I'll keep talking because that's what you guys are here for, I think. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Evan, and a bunch of uh, ones. Wrap it up, boys. We'll get them next time. Wrong a bunch of ones and I's and whatever and L's or whatever your your screen name is. You're not quite correct, actually. <laughs> uh, me, you know, they ended up getting it off on time, and, and I'm excited that it's it's now on its way into orbit. So, uh, thank you. Da ha. Hi, Tim. Love your channel, and you're really inspiring my photography. Just wondering, where is the archway looking out to L Slick 37B on your Instagram? From New Jersey. Well, thank you, Deha. Um, yeah, I had a picture of me looking. I, that's the Apollo 1 launch site. And for EFT-1, um, the Orion test flight, um, on top of a Delta IV Heavy, they actually let us go to, I forget what launch pad that is. Someone in my Discord, I'm sure Loopy or someone knows which pad that was. I forget the, which number it is. Like uh, 13 or something. Um, they let us set up cameras, actually, at the Apollo 1 uh, and it was also ended up being where, you know, the first Apollo capsules ended up launching from too. Um, but they let us set up cameras there. I think if you do like an extended tour, maybe John Eric or someone in a discord or probably again, loopy might know, um, you can take an extended tour and, and go out to that pad through Kennedy space center somehow, or, or maybe it's through the air force base. There is a way to tour that pad. Um, it's really cool. It's really historic. They have plaques up. Um, hopefully someone knows, um, yeah, that it, that I love that, that there's a picture too. Um, th I think you're referring to the picture where there's an arch, like it's like the cutout, and that's where you see the Delta IV Heavy taking off. Um, that's actually one of my favorite pictures because that launch pad was where they tested the Apollo capsule, and you're looking at the test of the Orion capsule. So those two images together are pretty cool. Um, there we go. Seth uh, says, uh, oh, it's the Vintage Space Tour. And Seth, uh, so it says... Puppetio, uh, and Seth says it's the Cape Canaveral tour from Kennedy Space Center. There we go. So that's how you can see that launch pad. I'm, um, oh, it's, it's LC-34, Launch Complex 34. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all your wonderful answers. Um, Emily, it does not want to go to space today, and it did, though. It, it you know, they gave it a little shakedown and wiped the dust off, and it was ready to go. Just had a, you know, a little coaxing. So, uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, Scatman Slaz, can we make it to the moon without SLS? We're about to find out. I think that's literally in review as we speak and uh, throughout the next week. I think we're going to find out if we can viably, with the vehicles we have today, Delta IV Heavy, Falcon Heavy, if you can do multiple launches to a, do on-orbit assembly and take significant payloads up to the moon and, and out that far away. It takes a lot of energy to get from low Earth orbit up to the moon, um, uh, several thousand meters per second. I forget how many exactly, three or 4,000 meters per second of Delta V. And um, so uh, Falcon Heavy, you know, even an electron can launch something to the moon. Um, a tiny little, you know, tiny little thing is capable of sending something to the moon. Not something very big, teeny tiny. So if you want to do recreate something like the Apollo missions, it's going to require multiple launches to a, do a, an on-orbit assembly. Um, I think my friend Marcus House has a really good videos, video where he used two Falcon Heavies and a Falcon 9 to assemble a lunar lander, a kickstage, and a dragon uh, crew dragon capsule on a really cool, really unique uh, mission out to the moon. And it's really fascinating. Uh, he did a really good job coming up with that. It's a really cool profile. So really, you could recreate something um, Apollo era uh, as far as a moon landing with two Falcon Heavies and a Falcon 9. But of course, logistically, it's a lot more difficult to do on-orbit assembly and things like that. But we're about to find out if it's a valid option as NASA literally is looking into using commercial providers to do a lunar uh, orbit mission with Orion. So we'll find out. And thank you. SF, uh, we touch on how launch windows work. Yeah, good question, SF. Um, so on a, on a mission like this, um, there's a certain window for GTO where they're, li they're lined up where when they get to the other side of the earth, they're lined up with the, where they can make an inclination change. Once they get like to the equator, or wherever the, um, the node is it's, it's so things like the international space station, when it flies over, you have to rendezvous with its exact orbit with this geostationary orbit is always relatively close. Right. Um, but it makes sense to have it uh, at a time where 
things like even being on the far, you know on the dark side where your solar panels you know and daylight solar panels there's a lot of variables that I still don't exactly understand that go into launch windows um, there's a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me that know all that stuff um, I don't exactly know exactly how that works it's it's pretty crazy um, I think I should probably figure that I need to do a, a basics on orbits someday a video all on like defining all the orbits and why why what when how and and what what each of them mean and that's something i want to touch on for sure is like why do certain orbits require certain launch windows so yeah um so thank you sf hopefully that helps corona again hi uh tim what are your thoughts about the star hopper moving to the oh i i did see that uh the one with the, wait uh, i did see your other one i'm sorry corona i'm just for you guys knowing, I'm almost an hour behind on on the super chats here, so I'm I am sorry. Um, I hopefully I answered that question, Corona. Thank you again. I'm sorry that you resubmitted. Um, yeah, that's I'm excited for. It. And again, I talk a lot about that on our Ludicrous Future our podcast. So if you do want to have uh, you know more info on my opinions, I talk I've just talk very openly on that podcast, so it's a lot more casual. Uh, it's more of a conversational thing. So if you enjoy. Hearing me talk about space and want more of the space news stuff, definitely subscribe to Our Ludicrous Future. Um, find it on your podcast apps. Find it here on YouTube. I talk a lot of space. I talk a lot about um, most of the stuff you're talking about. A lot of the questions, they do come up. And we have a fun series called Why Don't They Just? Where people say, like, why don't they just do this? You know, it's a question I get all the time. Is like, why don't they just catch the dragon capsule with Mr. Steven or something like that? Um, so we go through and we answer those questions. That's been a fun part of the, the podcast. So definitely subscribe to it. I, I promise. I think it's, I have a lot of fun doing it. So hopefully you enjoy listening to it. Um, Mike, Mike ISS or Mike is sweet. I read that as Mike ISS wheat, but Mike is sweet. Can't fail. Reliability is their only selling point. Amen. And you only knows that they know that uh, go fever can exist, but it's more important to have a hundred percent mission success. Um, that's extremely important to their company. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mike is sweet. D W L D John. What do you think about space flight simulator? Um, I have seen space flight simulator and, and played it a little bit on my phone. Um, it's, it's good and I'm excited to see it continuing to expand. Um, it's hard for me to go when I'm so used to something like it's like going from as a Photoshop user going down to like, um, Something that's mobile based is really hard for me to do. So going from something like Kerbal Space Program to Space Flight Simulator is very hard for me to do as well. But it is, uh, it's it's cool, and I'm I'm excited to see it get better and better every day, basically. Um, v Stray Light, everyday astronaut, spaceweather.com says we are getting hit by solar wind and affecting the magnetosphere. You're right. Um, I, I, again, uh, that show that I talked about earlier that I sometimes help contribute on tomorrow. T M R O. That's the name of the show. It's not like the day after today but the show tomorrow t-m-r-o their new news segment they even have space weather and space traffic reports it's super cool uh they do talk a lot about they have a, a woman that is really good with space weather and i learn a lot about how the sun affects a lot of things it's really fascinating actually i didn't know how much i enjoyed space weather until i started watching that so hopefully you guys get a kick out of that too um definitely subscribe to tomorrow t-m-r-o um the Maker Podcast, thank you very much. Chris Harris, enhance your calm, Tim Todd. <laughs> Always working on it. We'll see. Um, Steven Red, do you know what the flame stuff coming out of the booster? Yes, you were referring to earlier. We, we did touch on, on it earlier. They do have a tap-off, like a hydrogen tap-off um, that vents, purposefully vents and ignites uh, the gas, you know, the, the excess and, and pressurized hydrogen tanks. They have a, a purposeful tap off so that giant clouds of it don't develop and then accidentally ignite and cause a giant explosion. Um, you'll see a flame just kind of constantly trickling out, um, burning off excess hydrogen. That's what that was. And in that one shot, it looks like the rocket is kind of on fire, but in real life, it's it's behind it by several hundred meters. Um, so that one shot is just kind of confusing. But yeah, that's, that's what we were seeing. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Steven. And bust, bust a banana. Keep up the good work, bro. Can't wait to go to Mars. Yes. Dude, when we send people to Mars, I will be crying. You will see lots and lots and lots of tears from this person. <laughs> uh, the Maker Podcast, can you put uh, music on, please, while we wait and talk? Um, I tend not to just because it gets really complicated when I'm trying to listen in on things and it just adds another layer. Um, 
but you are more than welcome to throw on some music in the background and, and do your own mix. I recommend uh, there's an album called Maximum Aerodynamic Pressure by an artist named Everyday Astronaut that you can listen to on Spotify and iTunes. Okay. Uh, Phil, Felix the Wolf, which rocket would you rather fly with? I'm guessing you're referring to like human launching on a rocket. Um, you know, I would honestly at this point, where we're at right now, if I were to t say like, Tim, you can have the, you can ride on the next, then you get to choose literally any of the next. So DM two with SpaceX, you know, um, OFT, the, uh, the orbital flight or CFT, I think the crew flight test for, for Starliner, an upcoming uh, Virgin Galactic flight or an upcoming um, Soyuz launch or even an upcoming Blue Origin New Shepard. Believe it or not, I think I would like to fly most on New Shepard. And say what you will, I, I don't want to be in space for six months. Uh-uh, no way. That sounds terrifying. Uh, I want to see and feel weightlessness. I want to see the curve of the earth. I want to see the black sky. Um, I want to see that. And I really have a lot of confidence actually in the new shepherd system. Oh, here we go. Just shut down. And we have begun the thruster activity to uh, correct the, the body rate dispersions as expected. As you just cool. heard, we just saw the successful execution of Mika-1. Um, thank you so much for coming and joining us today and telling us all about WGS. It was great to have you. Thank you, Andrew. It was my pleasure. Awesome. Thank you. So now we're going to go into a, uh, their coast phase as they get ready for um, main engine, as they call it. I, I still think this is kind of their second engine. But they're, they're going to reignite this upper stage again. And I, th I think they have like a 20-minute coast phase or something. Well, I hope we find out exactly how long before they kick it up into their, um, into their geostationary transfer orbit. Um, yeah. Hopefully we get an update on that. Meanwhile, I will keep uh, answering. Yeah, so, so Philicus, I think New Shepard just seems like the right amount of excitement. Awe, wonder. Second stage is now turning to the mess two attitude as expected. Um, the right amount of like price. <laughs> I can't afford like a fifty million dollar whatever it is on Soyuz. Um, I don't think it's that much actually. I think private companies or private citizens don't pay. Now twenty one minutes. I think it's like right. twenty minutes. I am now joined by Sam Wiley. Sam, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. Great. I I know we have a couple of questions to ask you about WGS. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay. All right, we'll keep answering your guys' questions. Um, we'll hopefully get some more updates. I'll keep this on here in my background so I can figure it out. So there you go, Philicus. I hope that is a good enough answer. Um, Brian, you the man. Keep it up. Thank you very much, Brian. <laughs> I don't know about that, but thank you. Um, Mark Boyce, I used to support Isaac Arthur each month on Patreon, then switched to Joe Scott. Should I switch to you? That is absolutely not my decision to make. Um, I support a lot of people on Patreon based on when I when I realize that I'm tapping into their resources, when I realize that I'm uh, getting value out of the work that they're producing. That's when I'm like, I, I owe them like my support because I you know, people like Declan Murphy, Murphy with flightclub.io. I use his telemetry all the time. Jeff Barrett with his uh, infographics, you know, people that are out there creating content. A lot of my uh, launch photographers I support, via, a lot of launch photographers I support via Patreon because it's a lot of hard work and I get a lot of value out of their work. So that's just a personal decision. I, I don't think anyone is owed support. I don't think anyone, um, you don't need, you don't need to ever feel obligated to watch uh, and support someone just because you watch their content. That's not how this works. But um, if you're in a situation where you feel comfortable supporting someone, support someone if that's what you want to do. I... I don't have any say on who you should support at all. Um, I just know that I have a lot of value. I, I find more value in creators these days than I do uh, any like mainstream media. Um, that's just kind of the way I function. So for me, I know in order to make that continue to happen, that's why I personally choose to support. And I, I think most people would probably be on that same page. Um, but that being said, Isaac Arthur and Joe Scott are awesome content creators. So they're worth the support. Josh Nash, thank you very much. Jonathan Curtis, wish I could give more love everything you do. You don't have to say that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. And I just lost. Uh, wow, I'm a little ways behind here. 
Chris Harris system error, <laughs> the ULA rocket.ex. Hey, it, it did great. It's doing great. It's funny now that we are 40 or 45 minutes after I'm still reading those comments. And it's funny that now we have had a successful liftoff and we're good to go. Thanks again, Josh Nash, Corey shout out from Montana. Awesome. Howdy, howdy, Montanians, Montanans, Montananans. Uh, Renau, how are you? Uh, forgot there was a launch tonight once again at work. Hope for a great launch. Well, it seems like it's been a good launch so far, minus the little bit of delay, but we can take that when it ends up being a, a crystal clear launch like this so far. So um, thank you, Renau. And Josh, again, thank you, Andrew. Um, have a good break, Tim. Come back. Um, F-A-B. I don't exactly know what that means, but I will. I I will. <laughs> I'm going to do a lot of hiking. I, I I get rejuvenated by being outdoors and, you know, just having some quiet time. I'm going to go for some good long hikes. I, I get a lot of, and some stargazing. Stargazing, hikes, camping. I think just kind of turning off, unwinding. That's how I like to reset and recalibrate. That's what I'm going to be doing. And I really appreciate it. I'll come back the best refreshed version of me. Um, so thank you. Crash error. Did I see Apollo 11 IMAX? I did. I happened to catch it when I was down, uh, at the Cape, uh, a couple friends and I, we went and watched it and it was awesome. Joe and Michael and I went and saw it and it was, oh my gosh, it was nuts. And actually we found out that a lot of the dragon team, uh, was watching it at the same theater at the same time. SpaceX's DM one dragon team. Um, the <laughs> half the theater I think was full of them, which is really cool. And yeah, it was really absolutely stunning if you get a chance i think it's out of imax already but the apollo 11 film was just stunning there's like no storyline or commentary or anything it basically it's just beautiful footage that a lot of it has been delicately restored and a lot of old 70 millimeter uh, film restored and it is gorgeous so hopefully it comes out to other theaters this year um and yeah i i really hope that everyone gets a chance to see it because it definitely brought a tear to my eye i saw some things in detail that I never thought I'd see from the 60s, you know, from the late 60s. How cool is it that we have footage like that? And it, yeah, it is absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> Chris Harris, I saw this comment come through when you did it. Has anyone named Roger ever been denied a job based on his name? And he's <laughs> referring to, uh, you know, if you're on console and they're like, Roger. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I was saying Roger. Roger, what do you, what do you want? Roger, Roger, what? That's actually kind of a legit question that uh, that confuses me. I do want to hear what these questions are real quick. Brett, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Let's see if As you can see, we're pretty excited because you can see the Delta IV rocket right behind us, and it's a beautiful day. Soundtrack. Brett, why don't you start off by telling us about what you do at ULA? Oh, I thought this was so the questions. I'm going to listen in. I do want to see if we can answer any of the questions on the fly. But, if, again, if they're just straight, strictly about WGS, I don't have the knowledge on that. If it's about the Delta IV, I might have a little bit of knowledge on it. Um. So then we have a comment from uh, LI7 in 6. SRBs are poverty tier rockets for people who don't know how to make real rocket engines. Come at me, bro. You know, SRBs still have a place. I, I really do believe their thrust to weight ratio is pretty hard to argue with. Their price can be really hard to argue with. The fact that you can have them sitting for years and years and years and years and years. Uh, just hanging out and then it, at the like for an ICBM, like an intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile, and the fact that you can, after sitting for years, go poop and they're taking off that second. There's a purpose still, you know, um, they're dirty and they're they're can be potentially more dangerous when involving human flight um, can be. But that they aren't necessarily more inherently dangerous um, just in the fact that you can't shut them down. But. Yeah, uh, I don't I don't hate SRBs. I, I really like the way they sound. They're very loud, and that's kind of fun. So, yeah, and and uh, yeah, whoops, nineteen forty six says SRBs get you off the pad fast. They tend to, especially something like the Ariane five, just just is gone sometimes. It just as soon as those SRBs light, even watching the shuttle footage from the shuttle one, you know, those SRBs light and it just goes right away. It's they're pretty cool. Um, uh, Ghost slash 27 says SRBs can be shut down. They can be shut down by remote terminating them. Uh, and that's typically not ideal, but um, they, they can be. <laughs> um, 
there you go. That's that's my uh, that's my rebuttal to that. Lazy listener, thank you very much. Um, Grish sixty nine, could you give my son Chase uh, a shout out to Chase? Hi, Chase for his first everyday astronaut live. Chase, I hope you're still up. This this is um, thirty minutes later than the comment was originally received. Hello, Chase. Welcome to watching a rocket launch with someone that just absolutely is obsessed with this stuff. I hope that you catch the bug and want to watch all rocket launches. Um, even though some missions are, are more exciting doing crazy new things, they all are always very exciting to me just because, you know, you ne- there's so many, so many things that need to go right. Literally like hundreds of thousands or millions of parts all need to be working in perfect unison all together. And it only takes one of them failing to make the thing not work. So when a rocket launch goes off and it works perfectly, it just makes me really appreciate how hard and how smart people are that are able to put all this stuff together, make it work reliably, make it work. How, I mean, how does it even, how do you do that? It's crazy to me that we have figured out and, and I'm not going to quite say mastered space flight yet. We're getting close, but we're humanity. Dang. Humans are impressive. So, Hey, Chase, enjoy. Hope, hope you made it through this long. Um, Emily, why are S why are the SRB so tiny? That's a good question. Emily, I think it's because they, they can easily add and subtract and have no or a lot of SRBs based on uh, the mission demands. It makes us they can just kind of bolt on different ones. When they're small like that, they're easy to transport. They're easy to manufacture. They're, you know, you just kind of gain an efficiency in having many small SRBs compared to manufacturing uh, large ones. For instance, the SRBs from the space shuttle, the, the giant solid rocket boosters that were on the space shuttle. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do this for a little bit. Um, now that we're going back to this, uh, we're on the coast. Is the, the, yeah, I'm going to listen in here quick. Oh, they're doing this the... This is Delta Mission Control at T plus 30 minutes, 30, 13 seconds. As just reported, the RL-10 engine has been restarted. Our next event, Miko 2, will occur soon. Sweet. That's... I didn't realize the... The RL-10 chamber pressure, uh, locks and LH-2 inlet pressures all look good. And seeing good body rates throughout this second burn. Good. And seeing some periodic thruster activity as expected. Seeing the uh, ACS line temperatures are staying very close to bottle temperatures. Now two minutes remaining in the burn. Sweet. That's exciting. That's good news. Now passing 31 minutes into flight. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, there's not a ton to look at here. Except for, I do like seeing the apogee and perigee. About one and a half minutes remaining in the burn. RL-10 engine operating parameters continue to look good. Seeing good stable body rates throughout the second burn. And uh, seeing consistent values on the LOX and LH2 tank pressures. Notice these values are given in nautical miles. Um, I personally prefer the metric system. So when we're coming up on the perigee is raising to about 200 miles. That is um, 300 and, and about one minute remaining until main engine cutoff. 320 kilometers. And that's the lowest point of the orbit. And we're just coming up over 16,000 kilometers at its highest point. So you're going to see the apogee, the highest point, is raising um, most at, at this point because it's now passing through the lowest point of it, its perigee. So it's as it does this acceleration burn, the, the highest Engine point. Continuing to perform well throughout the second burn. Raises. Thrust chamber pressure uh, maintaining a good value. We are now approaching main engine cutoff two. Let's listen in. Okay, hopefully the uh, second engine shuts down fine. If it burns too long, that would be a bad thing. <laughs> but let's see here. Now standing by in approximately 10 seconds for engine cutoff. Looking for 22,000 nautical miles, basically, I believe is is uh, GTO. Or somewhere around there. And we have Miko, main engine cutoff. Body rates are damping out nicely from the cutoff transients, seeing uh, thruster activity to recover. 24,000, it looks like, is the apogee. 
We've just heard confirmation of the successful cutoff of the Arlton engine. The mission is now in a four-minute coast phase, flying above Western Africa. Separation will occur over the southwest coast of Madagascar, approximately 40 degrees east, east longitude and 18 degrees south latitude. Okay. This is looking good. All right, now let's go ahead and welcome back Sam. Sam, thanks for being here again. All right. I think we have a very exciting thing. We're going to announce our Twitter winners. All right, let's do it. Let's get started. All right, let's go ahead. Let's jump right into it. Fortunately, I, I missed that. We still have so many questions to answer for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> if you guys can see those questions, I I wouldn't have known when WGS-10 or WGS-1 was launched. But we were talking about SRBs quick in the space shuttle. Um, came, it had to be brought in on a train, uh, all these different segments, and then assembled uh, at Kennedy Space Center. And that's just logistically a lot harder than having a, an SRB, you know, small enough to be able to be on the back of a pickup truck and other things, or not pickup truck, but semi bed and things like that. So, yeah. Emily, that's why they're so tiny. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, Senwell, thanks for working overtime, Tim. I was fortunate enough to see Atlantis launch in May 2000, and it's hard to describe how awesome it was. I intended to be there to see Dragon and BFR. Uh, intend Well, uh, Sen Senwell or Sen Senwell or however you pronounce your name, I sure do hope that you make it out to some, some other launches. I really wish I had seen a space shuttle launch. Seeing footage of it now makes me just a little teary-eyed because I'm sad that I missed out on it. Um, it's one of those things that I don't think I appreciated until way later. I'm still gaining appreciation for the space shuttle today. It's funny because we went through this phase of like everyone poo-pooing on the space shuttle. When I did that comparison of the space shuttle versus the Starliner and versus the Dragon capsule and the Soyuz, honestly, that kind of woke me up and made me go, holy cow, the space shuttle was just a totally different beast, a totally different beast. It was nuts. It, it didn't live up to some of its promises, but it was just so crazy and such a marvel of, of engineering. So here we go. Hold on. My predictions. So now I think we're just basically waiting for payload separation. Once everything looks good. Now just one minute remaining until spacecraft separation. Uh, I see a question real quick from Yo, uh, Johannes or jo Johans uh, asking about wanting vehicle to build a Vehicle body rates remaining close rocket. to null as the vehicle is staying in its desired spacecraft separation attitude. Definitely, definitely subscribe to BPS Space, BPS Space, right here on YouTube. And uh, seeing uh, settling thruster activity as the vehicle prepares for spacecraft set. You'll learn so much. That's definitely the best if you want to learn about Thrust now 30 seconds remaining rockets. until separation. Here we go. It's crazy they go to the thousandth on that. Standing by for spacecraft set. The inclination degree. There we go. Hopefully we'll get good And we have good indication of spacecraft separation. Good. That's awesome. Sam, we just heard evidence of successful stage separation with right. WGS-10 satellite. Congratulations. Thank you, Andrea. This is another important milestone for our warfighters our nation and our allies. Go wideband and hang 10. <laughs> <laughs> great, great indication there. I'd also like to thank Patrick Moore for providing us with launch commentary today. If you want to learn more about our, today's launch and United Launch Alliance, please visit our website, United Launch, United Launch, U ULA Launch.com. You can also visit us on Facebook and Twitter. We'll leave you now with another look at liftoff of the Delta IV rocket carrying the Air Force's 10th WGS satellite. Cool. I'm Andrea on behalf oh. of the entire launch team. Thank you for joining us and have a great night. Nine, Thanks, Andrea. Eight. All right, so we're just going to let this play in the background. I got lots of questions to answer. So if you have asked a question, I haven't forgotten about you. Uh, I'm, still getting, I'm still getting into it. Um, yeah. 
There we go. So uh, the Orphander, great question. What's the purpose of the orange paint? Why not some other color? That's actually the natural color. It's not paint. It is the natural color of the insulator. So the tanks are insulated. Same. It's actually very similar insulation, very similar tanks, actually, to the space shuttle um, external fuel tanks. Um, and the insulation that they spray, it's a, it's a foam insulation they spray on there. Uh, they On the first space shuttle missions and on um, the Saturn V, they used to coat it and or it's paint it on top of that. They ended up realizing that that just adds weight and actually p has more prone to chipping off than... Uh, than just having the insulation be bare. So now when you see an orange rocket like that, that's just the color of the insulation, actually, the natural color of that particular insulation. So that's why it's orange. And thank you, the Orphander. Thank you, the Orphander. I'm Christian. How come there's, fl oh, how come there's flames, flares at the trajectory smoke approximately 30 to 100 seconds afterwards? Flames and flares in the trajectory smoke. Um... I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to there, Christian. Let me let me try and rewind here quick, see if we can catch a glimpse of what you're actually talking about here. Um, let's see here. Flames and flares in the trajectory smoke. Okay, they were still in a hold there. Here we go. Okay, flames and flares in the smoke... I'm guessing by trajectory smoke you're referring to afterwards. I'm going to... Um, I'm not seeing anything yet. That's all just... It's all just the flame so far. I'm um, not seeing anything too crazy. Flames and flares. Maybe you're referring to something you're able to see in person, because I, I think you said earlier, Christian, that you are there in person. It might be unburnt. Oh, there, maybe. That view. It may be unburnt bits of SRB propellant as it's ejected out. There might still be some stuff burning. But so far in the footage, I'm not seeing any other flames and flares. I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding the question, but I'm, I'm not exactly entirely sure what you're referring to. Um... But I know at SRB separation, you do see a little something. Yeah, let me know. If I didn't answer it, I'll look and, and see if... Uh, yeah. Okay, so James H. Bye bye, Birdie. You're right. It finally took off. And thank you. Thank you guys both for, for the, your generous tips. And, and also the Orphaner. I don't know if I thanked you. Thank you very much. Um, Andrew is Payday. Just sharing the love. YouTube people, please join us on Discord and Patreon. Thank you, Andrew Kaler. I do love our Discord channel. It has kept me... Far saner than I could be without you guys. Uh, I love our community, so uh, thank you for those of you that are in our Discord channel. Yeah. Um, the, Christian, aha. Elon tweeted his answer to what we all missed. We better check that out here when this ends. I absolutely want to see that because uh, the Model Y was revealed last night, and apparently we missed something. So guess what, Sean, that uh, bet me on, on uh, <laughs> 50 push-ups? Looks like I might not have to do them because it uh, looks like there was actually something bonus. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll check that out here in just a second. Um, um, oh, it's Jason. So people were uh, were saying in the Discord channel, we're saying it was SRB separation. Yeah, we were seeing the SRBs. You see those little twinkles there? That's probably exactly what you're referring to. Those are the SRBs falling off and tumbling through the air. You're seeing occasionally... When the engine is facing the camera, you're seeing still the, the burnout of the SRBs. But you see them tumbling like this because they just got flung off in one direction. They get flung off from the side of the booster and they continue to tumble all the way down. And so what you're doing is you're seeing the blink of the the burnout of the SRBs. I hope that answers your question, Christian. Um, so thank you again. And Dan, thank you very much. Stephen Reed, thanks for the answers about the flames. Didn't realize they were far behind the rocket. No surprise at Model Y unveiling. Done your 50 push-ups. We're about to find out here, Stephen. Stay tuned. Um, and from Liquid Chris, thank you very much from a fellow Iowan. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Chrono Surter says, if this is how sane I am with Discord, I'd love to see you without me. Oh, you don't want to know. You don't want to know. Um truck mini mini teaser i can't wait to see it uh lazy s listener hello oh yeah we're just re-watching 
we're just rewatching this, aren't we? So we there we go. The stream is actually over. We did it. I will check out. I will pull up um, Twitter here real quick, and we'll see what we missed. Let's see here. That's weird. It makes you log in in order to. I did not realize that. Um, apparently, I'm logged out here real quick. Let me get on here so we can all look at this together. One second here. Oh, geez. That's all it is. Hang on. What is this? That's the teaser pic of the Tesla cyberpunk truck. What are we even looking at? It just looks like a glowing coffin. What is that? Is that the truck bed? That must be the bed of the truck with a blue headlight. I'm very confused, but apparently that's what we missed. Huh. Well, there we go. Uh, I guess we're looking at the new uh, Tesla pickup truck, but I can't tell what we're actually looking at. <laughs> uh, Steven says, that doesn't count. Yes, it does. They revealed something else. I I do push-ups basically every day. Um, I don't want to do... It'd be really a boring live stream to watch someone do 50 push-ups. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Unless you guys absolutely need me to do that, but I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's more of a Tesla Roomba. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Hey, Everyday Astronaut. I meant to, so this is from Lazy Listener. I meant to include this message that a uh, message, a plane that flew here on Earth with no moving parts. Search for MIT no moving parts plane. Yeah, I, I saw some stuff about that. That looked really cool. I, I actually never watched anything on it because I don't always. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I need to, I definitely need to follow up on that. It looks, that looks awesome. Um, and learn more about how that actually works. So thank you, lazy listener. Um, sleeve dog. Did I see Elon's truck tweet? Yep. Any thoughts? Glowing, glowing coffin slash Roomba. That's about all I have so far. Luke Bowers. Thank you very much. And ultimate TH. Hey, Tim, new patron here. Thank you. Uh, which do you like more daytime or nighttime launches? You know, I like them both for different reasons. Daytimes are beautiful. Like the pictures from daytime launches are so beautiful. Um, I I don't like how hot it gets, <laughs> especially at Florida launches during the day. That can be a detractor. And some, you're sitting out in the sun for hours and hours and hours. It's just, it's just hard to fight, you know, like hard to fight, you know, sunburn and dehydration and things like that. But they're also a lot of fun. I don't know. That's a great question. I like them both for different reasons. I, I think I almost prefer night launches are very magical because you feel like you're already looking at space since you can see the stars and stuff and then watching a rocket go up and sometimes the night sky is so clear you can just see it go for a lot longer. Streak shots with photography are a lot of fun. I don't know which I like better between night and day launches. Um, don't make me choose. I like them both. I'm going to go ahead and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, um, yeah, there we go. I, it's the new battery. That's a picture of the battery. I don't know what you guys are talking about. You guys are crazy. Um, <laughs> that's crazy. I don't exactly. That's not a battery. I can't wait to see what that thing is. That is so weird. I'm going to, I'm sticking with that might be the truck bed of it, but I have no idea. Um, do rockets react badly in the Florida heat? Uh, no, <laughs> they, they launch from Florida all the time. They do great. The rockets have a very, uh, rockets have to handle like hundreds of degrees Celsius on ascent. Uh, they get really hot as they punch through the atmosphere. Uh, so they, they can handle the, the Florida heat pretty well. There is boil off that occurs. Sometimes the fuel, you know, it heats up from ambient temperature. It would be doing that unless the outside temperature is like minus a hundred degrees Celsius, then you wouldn't have as much of that boil off. But rockets can, are, are having, they have to design rockets around a very, very wide degree of temperatures from very, very hot to very, very cold. Um, so yeah. There we go, guys. And Josh Nash, thank you. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to tune off. 
I think it's time for me to go to bed, take the beginning of a quick little sabbatical, um, and I'm going to head out. And I, one more reminder, we do have a lot of new stuff in stock. Uh, the Gridfin Nauta Coasters are back in stock. You guys have uh, continually basically sold me out of these things. Um, I'm actually maybe going to get some actual coasters in, but I think I'm going to call them like thermal protection systems or something. Uh, I'll come up with something s silly to name them. Uh, but we have some new shirts and stuff. The gold edition version of these shirts are now in stock as well. Uh, so be sure. Uh, a lot of these things are, are limited run. Once they're done, they're done. So if you want anything, uh, and again, remember, if you do work in the aerospace industry, uh, you get 25% off the apparel section of my web store anytime. So um, click on something that you want to buy, and you can click on this link right here to receive 25% off apparel if you work in the aerospace industry. You have to have an email address that corresponds to uh, an aerospace entity such as NASA, SpaceX, Boeing, ULA, something like that. Um, and then it'll shoot you a link. We don't keep your email on file or anything. We just literally use it as a way to verify that you work in the aerospace industry. And then you get a code to take 25% off apparel at all times in my web store. So if you work in the aerospace industry and you have uh, an email address uh, of the aerospace industry, click on here. You can find out how to get 25% off. For the rest of you, though, patrons always get uh, a discount. I think they get 10% off at all times on anything in the web store. So if you um, want to shop often, consider becoming a Patreon just even... Um, the $1 a month can pay itself off right away. So yeah. Um, Steven, thank you very much for that last minute tip. Thank you so much. That's awesome. All right, guys, it is time for me to tune out. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so glad that the WGS 10 satellite launch and mission went perfectly. Congrats to ULA. Congrats to Boeing and congrats uh, to the Department of Defense for getting that important satellite up there. So, um, unfortunately, uh, this is the second to last Delta IV medium. So, everyone start getting ready to say goodbye when the last Delta IV medium launches. I think that's later this year. Um, so, get ready for that. We'll have to give it a little bit of a send-off or some kind of, you know, maybe we'll make cookies or something. I have no idea. But stay tuned for that. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, this has been, this has been great. It's time for vacation. That's going to do it for me. I am Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut bringing space down to earth for everyday people. Thanks everybody. Bye.